Everyone, welcome to Victoria City Hall, uh, located on the traditional territories of the Songhees and Esquimalt Nations, and uh, to the Year of Reconciliation 2017 in Victoria. Uh, Council, we have an agenda before us, and I will look for a motion to approve the agenda. Thank you. Moved by Councillor Thornton Joe, seconded by Councillor Alto. Uh, Council, I have a number of proposals for the consent agenda, and I am going to read them out. And if anyone wishes to pull any of those items, um, you can do so after I've read them. So uh, I propose the five sets of minutes from February 16th, sorry, February 2nd, February 16th, February 23rd, March 2nd, and March 16th. So that's items one through five. I propose items 7 and 8 with regard to rezoning application and development permit with variances application for 710 Belton Ave. Uh, number 13, Boulevard Tax Removal Application. Uh, number 15, Proclamation Earth Day. Number 16, Proclamation Child Abuse Prevention Month. Uh, item 17, Council Member Motion Heritage BC Annual Conference for Councillor Madoff. Uh, item number 18, Council Member Motion Attendance at the Capital Cities Conference uh, for Councillor Thornton Joe. Uh, item number 19, um, Mitigation of Impacts of McLaughlin Point Wastewater Treatment Plant. And item number 20, Council Motion with regard to Green Shores Certification. Does anyone wish to pull any of those items? Okay, seeing none, can I have a motion to add all of those items to the consent agenda? Thank you. Moved by Councillor Alto, seconded by Councillor Coleman. All those in favour of that amendment? Any opposed? Okay. Uh, Council, any further changes to the agenda? Okay. All those in favor of the agenda as amended? Any opposed? Thanks. So the first thing we need to do then is to approve the consent agenda. And for members of the public, uh, either here or online, when we put items on the consent agenda, uh, it means they will not be discussed today at this meeting um, at committee uh, and will be forwarded for our consideration to this evening's council meeting. So... Um, I should recap, I guess, for transparency what those items are, even though I feel like I just read them out. But uh, the consent agenda consists of items 1 through 5, uh, all of our minutes. Uh, items 7 and 8, the rezoning application and development permit application for 710 Belton. Item 13, the boulevard tax removal application. Um, 15 and 16, the two proclamations. 17 and 18, the two requests for councillors to attend conferences. Uh, and items number 19 and 20 with regard to the wastewater treatment. Uh, Mayor yeah. Helps, I'm wondering whether we should reconsider having those two items in the consent agenda since we may get new information from the representative from the project board. So I guess maybe I'll propose that council reconsider approval of the agenda. Uh, okay, well, actually, I think, I think it's fine. I think we, can, we don't need to reconsider approval of the sure. agenda. We have the consent agenda on the table now. Is, uh, actually, if someone could move the consent agenda. Thank you. Moved by Councillor Alto, seconded by, do we have a seconder? Councillor Coleman. All right, so now, now that it's on the table, we can properly amend the consent agenda um, motion. So you'd like to pull. I'd like to, uh, and I'd like to propose that items 19 and 20 be considered immediately after item 6. Okay, so let's just first... Um, pull them from the uh, consent agenda. So that will be the first uh, amendment that those are pulled. Is there a seconder for Councillor Isaac's amendment? All those in favour of the amendment to the consent agenda? Any opposed? Thanks. Uh, all those in favour of the consent agenda as amended? Any opposed? Okay, thanks. Councillor Isaac? I'd like to propose that items 19 and 20 be considered uh, after uh, item 6 so Thank that you. all items relating to wastewater treatment are discussed together. Thank you. That makes good sense. Is there a seconder? Second. All those in favour? Any opposed? Thanks. All right, we're ready to roll now. Um, and we do begin with a presentation on wastewater treatment from Mr. Fairburn, who is the vice chair of the project board. And he has with him Ms. Spooner, who is the manager of citizen engagement for the project. Good morning, welcome. Good morning, Mayor and Council, and thank you very much uh, for making time on your agenda uh, for this discussion. Um, I will uh, review our quarterly report, and um, Ms. Spooner will uh, provide some uh, detail, um, specifically around communications and engagement. So I'll lead off. And then uh, Ms. Spooner will will close. 
and certainly um, happy to uh, take any questions that um, you wish to ask of us. Now, I'm uncertain. Has everybody seen and read, if not read, seen um, the quarterly report? We didn't put the quarterly report on the agenda. Um, I think councillors are mostly aware of the status of the project. Uh, what is on the agenda um, for council's consideration or, or information is the uh, engagement plan. So you may want to just give a few highlights from the quarterly update, but this council has, I mean, they may have read it as part of the CRD um, uh, agenda, but it wasn't put on this um, on this agenda. I think specifically we're interested in the project update and, and even more interested in the public engagement. So that's the piece that council has uh, has reviewed. All right. Well, I'll I'll say less and uh, ensure that um, you can have a fulsome discussion around communications and engagement. With respect to um, the project, we are transitioning from the development phase into the construction phase. And um, as in most projects, this is a very intense period of time where we're doing our very best to ensure that um, we uh, implement as effectively as we can throughout this construction phase. And in reporting out to the uh, CRD um, core committee and to the CRD board, um, we have put together um, a quarterly report that um, attempts to provide an understanding of A, the approach to our work and the status of the work. And in thinking about the approach to our work, um, we think it's very important to be um, communicating not only as between the project board and the project staff and clearly um, the CRD and its committees, but also uh, reporting out um, to stakeholders and the public in a manner that is helpful, in a manner that uh, helps describe what our priorities are and how we're managing the project. And I think it's important um, to acknowledge that there are a number of things that we're focused on as a project board in delivering the project. And clearly one of the priorities for us is safety. Um, we start our project board meetings with safety moments, and uh, it's a very high priority, not just for safety of our own staff and contractors. Construction can be a very difficult environment in which to work and preserve safety, but also public safety. And so um, when we're moving forward into the construction period, um, we are uh, engaged in ensuring that we have the right policies and that we have the right attitudes and that we reinforce uh, wherever and whenever we can the value of safety. Um, we have a construction manager that we've hired. The construction manager is implementing uh, policies and we're ensuring that uh, each of the contractors that we engage through our procurement process understand fully the importance to us of the conduct of their work in uh, the course of this program. So from a safety perspective, we feel that we're off to a good start. We have it as a very significant priority. We're also, um, and you'll hear more from us this morning, um, very mindful of the need to engage uh, stakeholders and the need to ensure that we properly understand and clearly understand the interests of the community and that to the degree we can, uh, we respond to those interests and that we keep individuals abreast of our progress and that we address issues um, that are important and that can be addressed effectively. Regulatory requirements are clearly of importance. Um, we are heavily regulated uh, and regulated not only by uh, local government, um, but regulated also by regional government, by the province, and by the federal government, um, both through statute, permits, and uh, regulations. So we have a comprehensive list that we've assembled of all of the compliance requirements that we must pay attention to and that we must ensure that we do not violate. Um, some of it is self-reporting, some of it requires reporting by others, but um, the team is focused on ensuring that we know 
and that we can satisfy ourselves and therefore others, whether they be stakeholders or regulatory authorities, that we continue to be in compliance. Environment. Environment, again, um, the, uh, is closely related to regulatory requirements, but it's more than that. Clearly, it's the conduct of the work again. It's the manner in which uh, our values express the importance of the environment to us. And there is a big basket of things that fall into what we generally call the environment. But again, we're organizing our work. We're organizing accountability on behalf of our staff and on behalf of our contractors with respect to ensuring that we minimize over the course of construction and clearly over the life of the project environmental impact. So this, at this point in time, rests primarily on ensuring that our policies are correct, ensuring that our processes are correct, and ensuring that we can be subjected to any level of audit, if through a non-compliance or through a matter of course audit, we can defend our work. We can demonstrate that we have the right policies, that we've engaged in the right processes, and that the outcomes are satisfactory. And then finally, uh, we're focused on ensuring that we can deliver this program over the next four years um, within our control budget. Now, we had some discussion yesterday um, regarding, um, and I'll just hold this up. This is basically, it's a traffic-like summary of whether or not we are on track with respect to cost and schedule and safety and regulatory requirements. And one of the points was, well, this is very nice to see green lights in every one of the categories. Um, is that meaningful for us? This was a question from a committee member. And, um, you know, the rhetorical response that he offered was that, well, it's probably not meaningful at all because it's too early. And I didn't want to argue with that comment, but I want to express today that it isn't too early. The very beginning of big projects is where big projects go sideways. It's where you actually lose control of schedule. It's where you begin to lose control of safety, r regulatory requirements, environment, and our relationship uh, with the community. So while it would appear to be too early to be reporting and showing optimistically green lights in every one of the categories, in fact, it isn't too early at all. I think I want to convey to you that our real focus is ensuring that we're off with the right footing that we are cognizant of the values that we have to deliver on and that we've put in place good policy, good processes, and good people to deliver on them. The art of it is, of course, in the execution. And you'll have a better understanding of the quality of our execution as the project unfolds. But it's important that you understand that we believe we're focused on building a good foundation for the project as we move forward. And that we're focused in understanding that a week now is of greater value than a week in four years' time. Because this is what will drive our ability to execute the next few months of continuing to try to roll this project out and begin to commence construction. Now, one of the areas, and we're going to talk about this, that we are concerned about because of the significance of the work and the demands of it is, in fact, um, stakeholder engagement. And we, in our self-assessment, and there was, again, an exchange yesterday around, do we or do we not need to improve the quality of our engagement with community? And clearly, there's always room for improvement. And clearly, there are times when things go well and things don't go well when we're interacting with community. So I think we're committed, I know we're committed to continue to improve and we have uh, applied significant resources to this effort and we need to continue to apply resources to this effort and where we have insufficient resources we'll bring them on and again Nancy Spooner will speak to that. 
So in brief, this quarterly report um, provides more detail um, for each of the topics that I have uh, discussed, but it uh, should give um, a reasonable understanding, if you do read it, that we have um, entered into our contractual agreement with HRP, Harbour Resource Partners, to build the plant at McLaughlin, um, that we have uh, identified three shortlisted proponents who will submit technical and financial proposals in the coming months to design, build, operate, finance, and maintain the residuals treatment facility at Heartland, and that we are moving forward with respect to the design of the collection conveyancing system, including pump stations. I think and the cost to date uh, is in line with our budget. This early work that we have uh, conducted um, to date, uh, including prior costs um, expended by the CTERRA program, is $45 million on a control budget overall of 765 And we have, at this early date, no reason to believe that we will not meet that budget. Said positively, we continue to have a level of confidence based on our final negotiation with HRP and based on our ongoing procurement efforts for the residuals treatment facility that we will complete this program within the control budget. Of course, as we move forward into the other procurements with respect to collection and conveyancing assets, we'll be able to speak um, with either less or more confidence with respect to that forecast. But there is nothing that has arisen to date that undermines confidence in our ability to either deliver uh, within budget or on schedule. So I think I'll close my remarks with respect to the quarterly report. Um, we will be refining this report subject to requests uh, from the core committee and the CRD board to ensure that we provided the right level of information. And of course we have engagement um, through the CRD core committee and board on a more frequent basis than this report. So um, if you have questions now, I'd be happy to answer them, but maybe it would be best to transition to uh, Nancy Spooner. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. We'll hear all the information at once. Um, I do have a request, though, and this is my own oversight. Um, Mr. Coates, can we um, get the, uh, both the um, quarterly report if from yesterday's core area committee as well as the project charter for this project and add it to this agenda uh, after the meeting so that not only council but the public will have access to that? Thank you so much. Okay, welcome Ms. Spooner, go ahead. Thank you, Mayor. So um, I'd like to give you just a, um, an overview of some of the activities uh, we've done to date and what is planned for communications and engagement for the project. Um, but first, just an overarching um, perspective on our plan. Our priorities are to ensure that we are hearing the concerns, comments, and questions from all the communities that may be impacted by the project, and then to make sure that we are providing the solid information as it becomes available about the project, about the impacts that could um, impact all the different communities in different ways, and how we intend to mitigate them, and then to get input on mitigation strategies from the communities themselves. So that is our, our priority. Uh, to date, we've had um, two community meetings in January and two in April, the most recent being last evening in Esquimalt. Uh, we've had three meetings with the James Bay Neighborhood Association. We've had one meeting with Fairfield Gonzalez, a meeting with the McCauley School um, principal, PAC chair, and the police liaison around traffic and safety. Um, we have a planned meeting with Vic West coming up, and we will be meeting later with communities in Saanich as the project moves into that phase. And I would just add that the communications and engagement plan is built 
around the construction activities, the key construction milestones. And so as we move into each phase of the project, we will be reaching out to the communities there and making sure that they have the information and that we get information from them about their interests and concerns. Um, we also have an extensive inquiry response um, protocol. We get uh, many inquiries from the community through uh, both the project board email and through our wastewater project uh, email address and we have staff that are dedicated to responding to those uh, and tracking all of that correspondence. Um, when we do meetings, we do extensive notification. Uh, for this last round of meetings in April, we sent mailers to uh, 7,300 residents in James Bay and 9,900 residents in Esquimalt. We also had web notification. We did advertising in the Times Colonist and in Victoria News, and we use social media as well. But we are meeting with the liaison committees in the local communities to make sure that there are, we have a good understanding of how to reach the people in those communities. We know that each community is different, and sometimes uh, people don't read the paper, amazingly. Um, and others are not on social media. So we have to find more creative ways of reaching people. Uh, last night I had a couple of conversations in Esquimalt with folks who said, gee, this was great information, but I wish more people were here. And I know that young families are busy and they're trying to get their meals on the table and get their kids to activities. So we have to, we talked about perhaps um, working with the parks and recreation folks and getting um, posters and notifications to them so that they can put them in the places where, where families are gathering. So we are, we are working, um, getting some good input from the communities about how to improve our outreach. Uh, ahead, um, we have a plan to do a community update mailer, which is going to be going out hopefully next week, which summarizes the input that we heard in these two community meetings, the one last week in James Bay and the one last night in Esquimalt. That mailer will be going out to reach out to thank people who attended for coming, um, to let people know that didn't come, where to find the information, all the boards and the information is on our website and direct people to the FAQ function so that they can see the kind of key themes that we're hearing, the key questions people are asking about, and the information that we've provided in response. And, and that is going to be an ongoing function so that we come back out to the community and reach out to those people who aren't at able to attend our meetings. We also plan on um, probably in about two weeks um, going door to door on Niagara Street. We have had a lot of input, um, particularly last week in James Bay, folks coming to our meeting quite worried, uh, having uh, understood somehow that their street was going to be torn up and closed for weeks on end and understandably very anxious about that. So we provided the factual information, which is that there is no uh, tearing up of Niagara Street at all. Um, and there will be a short period where there has to be some work done there that will impact accessibility, and we have a plan for how we will help the residents um, make sure that they are not heavily impacted during that period. So we, we're worried that the Niagara folks uh, have had some misinformation or misunderstanding, so we are actually going to be going to door to door in that, on that street. Um, we also have, uh, we're working with the James Bay Neighborhood Association on putting together a committee. And that's just in discussion right now of what that committee will look like. And, and that should be up and running soon as well. And then we also have a meeting with Vic West, which is coming up uh, later on this month. Um, I think that's really all I need to, or I think I need to say, but I'm certainly open to questions from anyone on any part of our plan. This plan that you have before you was developed in the very early stages 
to give a broad view of how we intend to move forward on communications and engagement, but it is constantly being updated as we move into each phase of the project. So you'll note, for example, in Section 9, there's not much information on Saanich because that is quite far away, and we have not yet started working with the communities to determine how that engagement will take place. Thank you very much to both of you. Council, are there questions? on anything presented in these reports. Yes, Councillor Coleman. Thank you, and thank you for the presentation and the, the report. Um, it's the engagement side, just the beginning of Section 9 that I'd like to focus on at the moment. Um, I, there has been a sense of frustration in the communities, and we're all aware of that. Um, part of that comes from the Fairfield Gonzalez side uh, with respect to the crossover between uh, the construction and the impact of construction and the amenities package. And the report delineates between whose authority the engagement has. So on the amenities package, it's your support of city staff doing that work. On the construction side, it's your lead uh, and those impacts. And I think part of the frustration on the behalf of the community is, well, when are we gonna sit down and talk? We, we would like some timelines and it's now, you, fall of 2017 that it begins to discuss that but it's always been noted that we will do some of the amenities package or we will go through the process at the six at the 30 percent design stage at the 60 percent design stage and the 90 percent and that doesn't cause much um, calmness in the community because they they're trying to timeline that they're trying to figure out when am I going to have input into this so can we uh, find a better way to give target dates and, and let people know, and I think the discussion for some will be, can we add other amenities? And I, I think the position has been, no, the amenities package is pretty well set, but it's how we make it manifest, how we actually make it work for the community. Um, but there is a sense of unease because they don't know specific dates. And so if anything that can be done to help specific timelines or specific dates when at the 30% design stage, you will have this discussion. It would be very useful. I, I don't know if you have any comments on that. Well, I, I do understand that there was a requirement in the permitting that, that the project is presenting at very specific design stages, and I don't know that dates are attached to those yet. Um, but with regard to the amenity package, I, as we are in the supporting role, I would then look to the staff, Victoria, to determine when they would think that they would be proceeding if they're proceeding on those kinds of consultations. Thank you. Mr. Work, can you comment on the, and I know Mr. Tinney is out of the room, we might want to call him back, uh, on, the, on the plan for um, the timing of engagement, both on the public realm um, on uh, Clover Point and Dallas Road, as well as uh, working with James Bay to determine what amenities will be there. So some certainty around timelines, or if you don't have that today, some certainty around when we'll have certainty on timelines. Thank you, Mayor Helps. Uh, the license of occupation stipulates a number of different uh, check-ins with, with the community about design maturity, as well as check-ins with council and engagement of the, the design, as well as how that relates to the amenity package. Um, I don't have the exact 30% and 50% and when we'll be coming back, but we do have some information that's stipulated in the license, and that's part of the ongoing planning with the CRD to make sure that we have um, we stay aligned with the agreements as well as we have a good plan to come forward to the community. Um, now that we have some information about the timelines, the intent is with the different working groups between the city and the CRD to actually put a lot more meat on those bones so that we can actually then communicate that out and the residents are assured that the city and the CRD, or one or both, are coming back to see us, and we're going to be talking about this on that date, and that gives us enough time to actually provide input to the process. Staff have also been talking about when is the right time with respect to design to engage on the amenities, because some of the things and items in the, uh, the design elements that will show with the cycle track alignment would potentially allay some concerns about what would be an amenity or what's just part of the design. So, so I think we want to get that timing right, and uh, staff are committed to working with the CRD to now populate a little bit more detail, the, some of the dates that are before you now, so that we can actually communicate that and everyone can have a shared understanding of the detailed timelines. Yeah, go ahead, Councillor Coleman. Thank, thank you, and that's, that's useful, and I think that will um, appease some of the angst. The other side of that is there was a commitment to make sure all the plans and drawings would be available to the public five days before any meetings. And I think if we can extend that and give more time to analyze, it would be better. I don't know if that's possible, but that would clearly it's, it's a cause for concern. 
Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Isaac, questions? Uh, regarding Montreal, or sorry, uh, Niagara Street, um, you indicated that there would be a short time period of disruption. What's the estimated duration? Uh, I don't have that detail of that. Our project team, which uh, which was at the James Bay meeting last week and last night, would get, be able to give you more specifics on that. When we go door knocking, we will have a map to show them exactly where, and we will have that projected timeline. And Before you, could we get that too? Before you go door knocking, you absolutely can. Excellent. Okay, very and good. And when is that door knocking happening? Sorry? When is that door knocking scheduled to happen? Um, as soon as we get the materials together and, uh, and our team together. Um, next week, as you know, is a short week, so it is probably going to be the week after. So soon? Yes. Okay. Um, thank you. That's it for questions for now. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Yes, Councillor Loveday. Your, your microphone. There we go. Thank you for the presentation and for coming today. Um, I've got a couple questions. One is uh, regarding public in engagement going forward. And we had, uh, I'm really glad to hear that you're meeting with Vic West. And I know they've had some ongoing concerns about uh, the traffic from construction and what that's going to look like and, and just being able to, to look ahead and, and know what. Uh, the impacts that's going to have on the neighborhood. And we did have some problems getting a meaningful response um, from the project board uh, when that first came up. And so it's, it's great your, your meeting and, and that I'm sure will help address these concerns and, and move forward. But as this project will have impacts in a number of neighborhoods, how do people get a hold of the project board? What is, who do they, who do they contact and uh, is there a direct phone number or a direct email that, and what kind of turnaround can they expect in terms of response? Well, I'm a thrilled that you asked that question because I neglected in uh, my list of outreach tools that we are using to uh, include the public information line. Uh, so we do have and will have by May the 1st a public information line that people can call and ask any question, whether it's something specific to their own property and anything that they are experiencing or worried about, or it's a general question. Um, so the public information line will be manned, and then um, people will get a live body response, and then the protocol will be that depending on the nature of the call and which community is involved and which phase or part of the project, it will be uh, put out to the appropriate person to respond to. So that goes live May the 1st, and then we also have a website uh, wastewaterproject.ca and we have an email address that's associated with that so you can ask any question any member of the public and there is a response mechanism so um, then we also have uh, a way of capturing the key themes of those and those are put up on the website so that people can see the common questions and the answers what is the email address is it wastewater at crd.bc.ca it is okay great Councillor Loveday you still have the okay. Um, there's whispering over there. I don't know what it is. Uh, Charlene uh, dismissed the it's, So it's for all of us okay. and for the public. It's wastewater at crd.bc.ca. Thank you. Um, there's been a lot of questions from uh, residents in James Bay specifically about the idea of a seabed route for the pipe. And I know that uh, conveyancing, I know that... Um, a plan in place, but I'm wondering what has, was the seabed route explored and what did that exploration look like? The um, question is you're asking for an understanding of what the seabed proposal entails? Well, so having a pipe laid on the seabed from Clover Point rather than drilling and just was that explored by the project board? So the drilled portion, just to be clear, um, is the harbor crossing e from Ogden to McLaughlin. Yes. So it's sort of an it's an alter alternate. 
uh, proposal that that is many residents. So just to be clear, the alternate proposal doesn't have to do with the drilling. It has to do with not digging up Dallas Road. Right. The okay. con yeah, the conveyancing of the pipe. Right. So uh, just wondering about was that looked at? The, um, to my understanding, in the early phases of this project, no, it was not looked at. Okay. Um, and with the odor modeling, um, what's the, in the current contract, what's the limit for odor at the, at McLaughlin site? The specified requirement at the fence line is five odor units. So in the, in, in, in that's, in all the documents, like this one, it says it's going to be two. So is there, why the difference? So it would be helpful, I think, when you refer to that document for all of us. Could you just um, share with us the title of that document? Yeah, Odor Control, McLaughlin Point Wastewater Treatment. All right, and perhaps we'd be pleased to provide it to council. Um, is it from the boards from the meeting? Yeah, yeah. I provided that to council. All right, yeah. thank you. So the um, performance of the plant is going to be better than the specification. We have uh, a strong contract with HRP that requires them to meet the specification. In order for the contractor, HRP, to have the confidence that they won't be subjected to um, costs associated with their failure to meet that specification. They, excuse me, they are designing the plant to meet two odor units at the property line. Okay. And uh, so what is the, on, on a different uh, model, it, it shows that there is, it, it's up to 9.4, is that the, is that in the air but not on the ground or? What is the 9.4 odor unit? So I think it's important to ensure that when we have a legitimate question or concern that we all speak from the same set of facts. So I think the first obligation we have, it's our obligation, um, to, is to ensure that information that is delivered to the public by the project is A, timely, and B, accurate, and that we can all rely upon it. So the 9.4 odor units that you just referenced is from a 2014 proposal from Harbor Resource Partners. That information is not current. It's not timely. And nor is it representative of what HRP is committing to do. So there, um, that information was taken from an old proposal. It's great to hear. So the current information is as discussed at the community meeting and as summarized on this document. So um, any ongoing discussion with respect to odor should not include the prior modeling efforts in 2014. They're not representative of either the contractual commitments nor the expected performance. That's great. I, I hadn't seen the 9.4 number until this morning, and I was I'm glad to hear that that's why. Um, looking at the, the sound, can you explain a little bit about the, how, sound, how sound travels from or is expected to travel from McLaughlin um, across the water to James Bay and also Vic West in downtown? Um, is there, well, maybe we can advance the discussion a little bit. I have to confess, the physics of sound traveling, um, if that's what you're, you're interested in, is not something I'm qualified to respond to. Um, but I can say that, again, um, during the public community meeting, and as summarized on the information sheet in support of that, uh, we speak to the 60 DBA which is the specification for the plant. And we have done uh, modeling, isoline modeling, where we predict with wind um, over a long period of time 
and um, the dispersion of sound as it moves in directions 360 degrees from the emission, the emitter, which is the plant. And so again, on a modeling similar to what we've conducted for odor, uh, the modeling predicts from a 60 dBA source of sound in McLaughlin, a 35 dBA receptor um, at James Bay, 35 dBA um, at a point off Vic West. Um, and again, uh, in this summary, you see that the majority of the receptors to the east and the west and the north are ranged from 35 to 45 dBA, 45 being the highest, just northwest of the plant in a squamal. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Lucas, question? Yes, thank you, and thank you for the presentation this morning. Um, I, you know, when we talk about communication through the uh, helpline uh, that you mentioned and also an email, there are some extremely detailed questions that we're all receiving that I really don't think is going to be able to be managed through that. And I just want to give you an example. Last night I was at the James Bay Neighborhood Association where a presentation was made on uh, fault lines, earthquake, um, it was very um, um, intense, and um, I can tell you a lot of people, as we were walking out of the meeting, people were going, ah, maybe we should be moving from the island. But those are very detailed questions, and I can't imagine somebody being able to take that information and um, go on an email or uh, a helpline. So you did speak about a citizens committee in James Bay. Is this kind of the place where um, this information, this detailed type of information is going to be disseminated and passed along to residents? Like, what is your plan for things like that? Well, our plan for communicating is communicating the information we have on the project that is approved and that is being built. We can't speak to information that is being provided by third parties. Um, the information that's being presented um, with regard to the alternative suggested route uh, is being presented by a group. Uh, that uh, alternative route was investigated by uh, our engineers, and we did a technical memo responding to the various parts of the proposal, suggesting why it wasn't being considered and, and wouldn't be moving forward. But for us to respond to scientific data and information that's being provided to residents by a third party, I think it's very difficult for us to take responsibility of that. And I do understand that, but it is um, it does need to be addressed because what what it is doing is um, creating a lot of um, angst and concern um, and um, I, I wonder, can you um, uh, do some form, I know you did the open houses and you had people there and, and you had the boards because I attended, but um, is there an opportunity moving forward where this type of, where you were talking about uh, a third, or the, um, a report had already been done on this? Mm -hmm. Like where is that information for people to be able to get that they already, um, looked at that seabed route, they chose this one, like where, where do we send people to other than just say, oh, go see a website? Because that's more complicated for some people to be able to do. Well, so there's two things. One is there, that technical memo responding um, to the alternative route is on the website. Um, and we have had, last night we had 26 uh, different uh, specialists, noise specialists, odor specialists, the same uh, last week in James Bay. Noise, odor, geotech, and so um, those people are able to speak in great detail with individuals one-on-one -on -one about their specific questions. We aren't in a position to do that, but that's why we bring the experts to the community meetings. Um, but with regard to the general concern that is being raised, and I absolutely appreciate that we need to take it seriously, because uh, the project uh, has a belief that what the route that is being chosen is being done has been well reviewed, and we have geotech experts that have done the work 
the company that's doing the drilling has does it all over the world and is doing their own extensive additional testing. So we have confidence in our specialists and they are coming to the meetings to answer questions one on one. Um, there is not a, a, a way yet that we can address any of the detailed scientific questions other than if people come to our meetings and, and ask our experts. Thank you. Are there any? Yes, uh, Councillor Madoff, go ahead. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. And thank you for the presentation. I'm just wondering, specific to communications moving forward, do you anticipate any um, meetings that will follow the same format as, the, for example, the community meeting that was held in James Bay last week? Yes, that is the way we do most of our large public community mm -hmm. information meetings, and we do that format for a number of reasons. Uh, we um, know that people are busy, and we know that if we do a presentation at a specific time, it's very difficult for people to get there. So we do a three-hour open house. We have all the experts there in all the various disciplines and parts of the project. And that allows people to come. Sometimes people want to come right away after work and then go home and feed their family. Sometimes they want to get dinner on the table and come afterwards or whatever their schedule is with uh, their families. So the three-hour period allows people to come and to ask questions one-on-one -on, -one on specific items that they're interested in. For example, last night people came. They only wanted to know about one thing. They went straight to that specialist, got their answers and and left. So that's the format that we use. It's flexible. It allows us to give a great deal of information and have a high concentration of expertise in the room at once. And then we try and take that information out as much as we can as we are next week in summaries so that for people who didn't come to the meeting we try and get the information out more broadly. And then that's the same with notifications on upcoming. The exception to that though is the uh, small community meetings where there's particular interest and obligations as part of licensing agreements that we will be meeting with smaller liaison groups who have specific interests and those are also following a schedule of key construction milestones. Well, I'm just wondering, I attended that meeting, and I've attended many meetings that use that format. We've often used that format as well. And the feedback that we tend to get is that there is a degree of frustration, that there isn't an opportunity for people to come together and hear the questions and answers together. Mm -hmm. And I know I'm hearing some frustration um, from, um, from the board about misinformation. Well, that was a hotbed of information, misinformation, misunderstood facts mm -hmm. because people were getting it one-on-one -on -one, and it was like the, the party game where you sort of pass it along from person to person mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and there is such a value in bringing people together so they can learn from each other's questions and get one answer mm -hmm. so I'm wondering if there are meetings that are going to follow that format if it wouldn't be possible to have a hybrid where there is a period of time where people can actually sit down, ask their questions with the experts, and everyone can hear the same thing. Mm -hmm. Because certainly that was the frustration that I have heard at that meeting, and it's what I felt, as well as I was trying to get uh, the information within that kind of venue. Right, thank you for that. And we can certainly look at that. Um, the last week's meeting was unfortunate because there was a large group of people who are organized to convene and arrive all at the same time. Mm -hmm. And so it was difficult for, even though we had 25 experts there, um, it was difficult to manage. 75 people had signed up already uh, 20 minutes before the meeting began. Mm -hmm. Normally that doesn't happen. Last night it was very um, easy throughout the whole three hours. People came and left. Um, the tone in the room was very comfortable. People left happy that they got their answers. Mm -hmm. So normally, and we do this uh, format all over in lots of large projects, it works really well. Mm -hmm. um, but if a group decides to come all at once and wants the information all at once, it's more difficult to manage. Mm -hmm. But as I said, I think that bringing together opportunity is very useful. The, the graphic example I'll give is somebody who had gone to the, what, the, the, the station where there were the, the staff who were the odor experts. Mm -hmm. So two different people went, asked questions. I happened to speak to both of them. One of them came away saying, there's not going to be any monitors for odor. And the other one came away saying, there's going to be monitors. So in terms of you know, the frustration I'm hearing about information that sort of 
takes on a life of its own, right. that format can actually feed yeah. that, unfortunately. Yeah. So if there is an opportunity for a hybrid at the appropriate time, I think it would really help. Thank you. Well, we will certainly consider that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Madoff. Councillor Alto, question? Uh, yes, and uh, I think those of us who had a chance to be at the CRD yesterday have probably asked a zillion questions, <laughs> but I just wanted to uh, confirm what I think I heard yesterday uh, on the matter of uh, not just information sharing, but on sort of the concept of inclusion as we move forward. And it was my understanding, and I just want to clarify this, that you're anticipating having um, with Esquimalt a type of liaison committee that will work with the project board and uh, its operators and designers and workers as the project moves forward, particularly on construction and operation. And I think when I asked this question yesterday, I heard you say that you're anticipating something similar uh, to include the um, affected Vic West, or affected Victoria neighborhoods, Vic West, Fairfield, and uh, James Bay. Is, am I correct in that, that that's sort of on your radar as a combined group, or at least you, that you're talking about the idea that you have a combined group that would be more involved as we move forward, as opposed to just receiving information from you, actually be more engaged with the conversation as we move forward? So two questions. Um, the With regard to the Squimalt Liaison Committee, that is prescribed and mm -hmm. as to who attends and yep. it's part of the agreement. Um, we're working with James Bay and Fairfield Gonzalez and Vic West to determine whether they want to be mm -hmm. in one group. Uh, I think um, each has different interests in parts of the project. So um, we've had more conversations with James Bay and we're in the process of determining the scope of that group mm -hmm. and whether or not Vic West wants to do their own and where, whether Fairfield Gonzalez has interested in participating. We're still working out. I would say, though, that the scope of the discussion will be focused on communications and ensuring that we receive information about impacts and can respond accordingly. We will not be presenting technical information at those meetings. Mm -hmm. Sure, I get that. But, but it would be fair to say that you're anticipating whatever it looks like. And it'll, it sounds like the conversation will, will rest with the neighborhood, neighborhoods themselves as to what it looks like. But that the intent would be that there would be uh, a mechanism for a, a closer exchange of information and conversation. I'm just following up on the questions of some of my colleagues. Mm -hmm. But I think what the frustration is is there's lots of information going out, but the processes are kind of one-sided. So what I, what I thought I heard yesterday was your anticipation that there would be some mechanism designed either collectively or individually or you know by neighborhood, however it ends up looking, where there is uh, an easier exchange of information and more of a back and forth as opposed to a, just an information out. Yes, I, am, absolutely. Right? Yes, you are correct. Okay, thank you. Yes, and also to respond to that, we made an amendment yesterday at the um, CRD committee to have that reflected in the quarterly updates from the um, from the project board in the 11.3 um, of the project um, update. Uh, thank you. I don't see any further questions. Mr. Coates, I do have a, a request for your department. The core area meeting um, of the sewage committee is the second Wednesday of every month. So can we have someone from your department um, on that Wednesday go and take all of the reports uh, off the CRD and circulate them to council? We don't need to have uh, the project team come here every month. That's our job as CRD reps to keep the rest of you informed, but I think it's really important that Council has that information on a regular basis. And then if there are questions, we can make sure that they're answered. Okay, excellent. Thank you both very much. Uh, Council, we have moved um, items uh, 19 and 20 uh, up to this portion of the agenda. Just for Council's information, uh, a version of both of these was passed uh, yesterday by the CRD, um, the Sewage Committee. So the CRD already has this on its radar. The Project Board already has this on its radar. Uh, there's nothing stopping us from passing these motions again, but just so that we know um, this has been attended to already. Uh, so um, uh, item number 19, um, mitigation of impacts. Councillor Isaac? I'd like to remove the recommendations in 19 and also the recommendation in 20. Okay, thank you. Um, so 19 and 20 have been moved. Is there a seconded by Councillor Lucas? Thank you. Um, may I suggest that we strike the uh, and be it further resolved, or do we want to forward it anyways because... Before it, okay, very good. Uh, discussion on those items? Yes, Councillor Isaac? I wonder if Mr. Tinney can uh, address the issue of the Green Shores certification. Is this design standard on the city's radar screen at all? I can do it. 
It's from the Environmental Stewardship Council of BC, or whatever. Mr. Work. It seems to run through all three operational <laughs> portfolios, which is a good sign. The three amigos over there. <laughs> uh, That's meant lovingly, by the way. Through, through the mayor. Um, we've embarked on a number of discussions about the Green Shores program for the David Foster Harbor Pathway, as uh, was put in front of council of, of, a few months back, and about how we could use that to enhance uh, some of the uh, more natural features and reintroduction of more natural features along the coastline where we touch with the harbor pathway as we go forward. So we're, we since uh, had, I think, three staff trained on the Green Shores certification program based on uh, the desire to sort of understand that system better and how that could help us moving, moving forward with the planning of the David Foster Harbor Pathway. Um, when we first looked at this, this motion for the Clover Point location, um, we, I haven't gone through in a, in a lot of detail yet, but I would, I would suggest that there is some key questions to, that, would, that we could ask and discuss with CRD about what the Greenshore certification could mean to the engineering of the Clover Point site and how that could potentially impact cost as well as the location because of the, uh, the, the way that it's currently constructed with the, uh, with the civil infrastructure that runs along the waterfront, which, uh, which would obviously impact the project greatly to, to remove that or, or, or uh, redesign that in effort to meet some of those those certifications. Uh, in our discussions and staff's discussions with some of the experts in the Greenshore world, they've suggested that some sites are very appropriate for this type of uh, initiative and this type of consideration for certification, and other sites maybe are not great contenders. Um, so while we continue to progress those preliminary discussions at the staff level, um, those are sort of my scene setting comments or considerations for Council to weigh as, as they move forward with this particular question. My understanding is that the criteria and the weighting, there's at least three different levels of green shore certification, similar to the LEEDS standard. So uh, hopefully elements of that uh, accreditation process can be pursued. And um, I think it talks about preserving natural shoreline where possible, but also um, creating replacement habitat where possible and uh, generally applying an ecological restoration lens to the project, even looking at issues around surfaces and rainwater and bioswales and uh, in the proximity to that site. So I, I think it's a valuable lens and I hope Council can support that provision of uh, the motion as well as the other elements of the motion. Thank you. Um, and again, for Council's information, this portion was passed yesterday as well, so it's on the CRD's radar. Uh, Mr. Uh, Work, you had a response? Thank you, Mayor Helps. I think just to wrap it up to answer the question, yes, it's definitely on our radar. As Mr. Soulier reminded me, that it's part of their Parks Master Plan, uh, as well as it's, uh, it's now as part of our planning for the David Foster Harbor Pathway. So it's definitely a lens that we use in our planning as we move forward, and, uh, and, we, and we seek to apply various portions of that uh, or best practice uh, where appropriate. Thank you very much. Yes, Councillor Lucas, as the seconder, go ahead. Thank you. I, I just wanted to um, uh, thank you for, for suggesting that we get these um, minutes and, and uh, from the CRD, especially for Councillor Loveday and myself, who are representing those two neighbourhoods, Vic West and, and James Bay. It will be really helpful to get that because we were not there in attendance yesterday. So it makes it difficult when we are given last-minute information. But... We're not really sure what got passed. So thank you for making that suggestion. You're welcome. And actually, I'm going to refine my suggestion um, based on what you said. Mr. Coates, can I give different direction? Those reports go live on the Friday before the Wednesday. So as soon as they go live, if you could have them taken down off the CRD's website and forwarded to all of council so that everyone has the information at the same time as the public. Excellent. OK, thank you very much. Uh, any further discussion? OK, all those in favor? Any opposed? Thanks. Okay, so we move on now um, back. So for the members of the public, we were just on items 19 and 20. We're jumping back now. Uh, earlier in the agenda, we have uh, dispensed with items 7 and 8 through the consent agenda, and we are now on item number 9, um, rezoning application for 732 Tai Road. And I just wanted to say as a preface to this, we understand that the federal government is proposing cannabis legislation today, uh, and we have our staff on standby to scrutinize this legislation immediately uh, once it's uh, announced to make sure that if there's anything in there that changes uh, what we're doing, that we uh, fall into line immediately. So Mr. Coates and team are standing by, uh, and we'll hopefully have some more information before the um, rezoning application tonight. Anyways, go ahead. Welcome. Thank you, and good morning, Mayor Helps and Council. Uh, my name is Mike Angrove with Development Services, and today I'll be presenting an application for rezoning for storefront cannabis retailer at 732 Tai Road. 
Uh, moving through the context slides, the property is located on Taiyi on a block face occupied by various industrial uses and professional services. It is located across the street from the rail yards development. Uh, this slide shows a view looking at the front of the property from Taiyi Road. There is an existing storefront cannabis retailer on the property that was in operation prior to July 28th, 2016. A view of the neighboring property to the south, the Island Community Mental Health Association, and the adjacent industrial businesses to the north, including the Albion Fisheries Building. And finally, a photo looking directly east of the subject property onto the rail yards development. Uh, the OCP designates this property within the urban residential urban place designation within which commercial uses are only permitted on arterial and secondary arterial roads, which Taiyi is not one of them. Uh, rezoning would require an OCP amendment, which staff are not willing to recommend at this time. However, a temporary use permit, which the applicants are amenable towards, is recommended by staff for a number of reasons. Uh, first, the Victoria West Neighborhood Plan is currently under review, and very early indications suggest the potential for this block's urban place designation uh, could change. Second, the existing building provides for an acceptable temporary space for the proposed use until such a time that the property is redeveloped. The temporary use permit would be valid for three years, with the ability to apply for a maximum extension of three years after that time. Currently, the Victoria West Neighborhood Plan designates the property as Songhees Business slash Mixed Use dash some residential option within which commercial uses would fall under. And finally, this slide displays that there are no other storefront cannabis retailers nor any schools within 200 meters of the subject property. Therefore, staff recommend that council consider supporting this application as a temporary use permit rather than a rezoning. Thank you, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, uh, Councillor Loveday, and then I have a question, and I'll go to Councillor Thornton-Joe. Yeah, thank you for the presentation. My question is, uh, have we considered just doing temporary use permits for all of them? That's and, our collective question. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and, <clears throat> and would that be recommendable? And can we? Through the mayor, that was something that was explored a couple of years ago when council was considering the policy overall. Generally, the, the um, one of the biggest considerations with the direction of a temporary use permit is that most applicants want a, a permanent decision. Putting that aside, the work to undertake a temporary use permit is uh, consistent with the same amount of work for a rezoning. So you could administratively end up with a situation where applicants come in, they're paying the fee of $7,500, this lasts for three years, then they're paying $7,500 again uh, to extend it or potentially to rezone it. So you could end up with a series of, for nine years, we're going through a series of temporary use permits and rezonings, which, as you'll recall, uh, Council did pass a motion with the policy to uh, add additional staff to the Development Services Division in order to do that. So it has some effects in terms of how would we manage a series of rolling temporary use permit applications and rezonings, but uh, Council could consider that. Thank you. Mr. Tinney? The, the other consideration is um, I think that, that the, all the indications that we're getting and perhaps you know, has, has been confirmed relatively recently is, is that the, some form of this, uh, the, the sale and, and distribution of this product will become legal. As such, the, it makes sense that the city zoning bylaw responds to that in a permanent way the same way it does uh, the sale of sneakers. Um, and so the, the recommendation and the decision that council made several years ago was to, to identify this as a land use and, and, and move it forward based on the same uh, provisions that are um, um, in use for, for private liquor stores in, in a, a similar situation. That said, council can, can certainly change their mind. It does, as, as um, uh, Ms. Meyer suggested, add a significant burden uh, likely to the, um, um, uh, to the department's um, ability to, to actually uh, administer these. And again, there, there may be further changes, and this may be one tool based on on the, uh, the outcomes of, of what we hear from the, the federal government perhaps today, although I think we'll, we'll um, uh, further changes will be driven once the province weighs in on this at some future date. Thank you. Um, my question was the exact same as Councillor Loveday's question, um, so I'm going to go to Councillor Thornton. Joe, do you have a question? That was um, my major question, and I'm still trying to wrap my head around the, the pros and cons of still uh, taking that route. But my just a, a quick second question is, um, in the report, uh, they talk about a security protocol employee handbook. 
and a copy has been attached for your reference. And I don't see the report, uh, the the employee handbook in our report. And I was wondering if there's opportunity to get to receive it. Uh, through the chair, that would be normally reviewed through the business process, okay. business license process, um, not necessarily through the land use process. Um, I, th I think we could certainly give a copy, though. But again, it would not be a relevant consideration relevant the, for the land okay. use. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. That's, thank you for the clarity on that. Um, that's it for now. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Isaac. Question? Can staff explain how the public uh, consultation process on the temporary use permit differs from a rezoning? What opportunities for public input would there be prior to council's decision? Uh, as far, through the chair, uh, it's similar to a development variance permit, so there is an opportunity for public comment. Similar to a public hearing, it's just called the opportunity for public comment. So, from the public's experience, would it come? Uh, would it be almost identical to the what the city's providing for the rezonings? Ms. Meyer. There are a few differences, and I'll look to Mr. Coates. I'm fairly certain I'm correct in saying that the notification distance is just the adjacent neighbors, not uh, people within 100 meters. Uh, again, council, I would imagine, could probably specify some different requirements. And as well, notification is different. So a uh, rezoning has a sign on the site, and an ad is put out in two consecutive issues of a newspaper. Uh, if and when there's a motion on the floor, I'd like to, if it includes those elements, I, it may be supportable, but otherwise I'd like to add those elements that the public engage input okay, process. How will you put the motion on the table or someone? I'm going to defer to the council liaison for Vic West, if, if, unless he doesn't want to, and then I could. Okay. Um, okay, I'll move so the staff, staff recommendation. Thank you. Staff recommendation has been moved. Is there a seconder? Seconded by Councilor Lovday. And then Lovday. I'll move additional wording that... Um, uh, opportunities for public input and notification uh, mirror uh, the process for a cannabis dispensary rezoning. Second. Okay, moved and seconded. Discussion on the amendment? Okay, all, uh, yes, on the amendment. Go ahead, Councillor Alto. Just to clarify, the, the, um, I understand the notification part, but the uh, public input part mirroring the process for uh, a rezoning, does that mean that we'd have to have a de facto public hearing? If we do have an opportunity for public comment anyway, yeah. so. so. I'm just trying to clarify what it would look like. Right. I guess technically would it be a public hearing or an opportunity for public comment, Mr. Tinney? It is it it is technically an opportunity for public comment. That said, from the public's perspective, they are somewhat uh, indistinguishable. Um, it is, the, the, the primary difference is the notification area um, and the, you know, the, but, but the process for council, similar to a development variance permit, uh, the process for council in, in the chambers is somewhat similar. Thank you, Councillor Isaac. And I think with notification in here, my expectation would be that includes both the radius for notification as well as signage on site. Would that be staff's understanding? That if, that yes, we would take this to mean that we would treat it in terms of notification and engagement as if it was a cannabis dispensary rezoning application. And I guess just the rationale, I think VicWest residents, I would, there could be a perception that for some reason this is being fast-tracked or the standards are lower, and I know that's not the intent. I think staff's rationale for going the temporary use permit is sound, um, but I think to avoid that perception, this is, I think, a safe way to proceed. Thank you. Uh, further discussion on the amendment? All those in favor? Any opposed? Discussion on the main motion? Yes, Councillor Coleman. I, I, we've focused on the temporary use permit as an opportunity to allow this to occur and sit for three years. What's the difference in entitlement between a rezoning which gives some surety over time and a temporary use permit which has a maximum of three years, but can it be pulled early? I mean, I'm trying to understand the business implication uh, as well for the temporary use permit. Can it be pulled early? Thank you. Yeah, that's the better question. Can it be pulled early? Because what we want in the business modeling, assuming that legislative changes are happening in Ottawa or will, are being signaled today, then the temporary use permit doesn't give the surety that a business model might require. So that's the reason you, you started down that line earlier, about nine years. But what entitlement, does the entitlement last for three years? 
staff would need some time to confirm that we have the correct answer to you on that. We did, in a different context, discuss something similar yesterday internally, and there may be um, some ability to cancel a permit, although it seems unclear in the legislation under what conditions a municipality could do that. So it might be one of those things where technically it could be cancelled, but it's not clear how one would cancel it. But I, we can get back to you with that information. Thank you. What I would suggest is that if this motion passes uh, today, now, uh, that you provide that information to us this evening at Council if that's possible. Is that good? Yes. Okay, excellent. Very good. Because this would come forward as a committee recommendation to Council tonight. Any further questions? Okay, all those in favour? Any opposed? Thank you. That carries. And thanks, staff. And we will look forward to that uh, tonight. Uh, Council, I know it's only 10 after 10, but I think the next item is going to be meaty and we're going to want to dive in. So I would suggest we take a five-minute recess before we go into the Johnson Street Bridge public realm discussion. All right, I would like to call us back to order, and we are on item number 10, Johnson Street Bridge Public Realm Design. Um, Jonathan and Jonathan, welcome. Uh, thank you, Mayor Helps. Um, I'm Jonathan Tinney. I'm the Director of Sustainable Planning and Community Development for the City, and I'm joined by Jonathan Huggett, who's the Project Director for the Bridge, uh, the Johnson Street Bridge Project, who uh, has some, uh, some, some technical background in this area in case of uh, council questions, and uh, is backing me up here today. Uh, so the purposes of the uh, presentation and the report here today is, is to present the final concept design for the Johnson Street uh, public realm areas, uh, including some recommendations that staff have provided for phasing and funding of, of these areas. Um, the, we're also looking to seek dir uh, direction from council to prepare an interim design based on the JSB final concept plan. Uh, just as background, if Council will recall, in uh, late 2015, early 2016, the City hosted a design workshop with a number of different stakeholders, um, you know, in and around the, uh, the bridge area and, and um, the bridgehead areas. Um, it was a detailed workshop working through with, uh, with some of those folks to, uh, to address uh, some of the technical aspects of, um, of these public realm areas. Um, the decision at that time by Council as well was also to look at some of these public realm areas uh, in a very different light. Uh, and so essentially to um, um, take the opportunity that's created by the, the bridge project uh, to actually expand upon and, and um, uh, further potentially further invest in some of these uh, public realm items um, uh, to, to create some new people spaces uh, in, a, in a, um, relation to the bridge. In 2016, uh, public consultation was undertaken on some draft concepts. Uh, an open, a series of open houses were held to get feedback on uh, a number of options for the different uh, public realm areas. Um, since then, uh, design refinement has been going forward with the preferred concepts uh, with the landscape architecture team as well as with a, a fair amount of work from, uh, from city staff and investment by staff. Um, the outcome is the, uh, the refined um, concepts before you as well as uh, preliminary Class C cost estimates for, for each element um, that uh, support sort of a phasing and funding strategy. Um, as, as these were developed and, and refined, the public realm areas were, were sort of uh, based on principles that uh, um, prioritize public access, active transportation connections, accessibility, as well as improvements in new park and plaza spaces, as well as uh, maintaining and optimizing harbor views. So when we talk about the public realm areas uh, around the bridgehead, we're really talking about sort of four primary areas. Um, these include, I think you can see my... Uh, the Janion uh, Plaza area, which uh, if, if councils walked by recently, they can see that that is currently under construction. Uh, there's also the Central Triangle um, planted area, the Northern Junk Plaza, the former S-curve lands on the southwest corner, as well as some uh, improvements to the Esquimalt Road intersection. The Squamalt and Harper Road intersection, um, the, the concept and the proposal being uh, um, pursued here is to provide it's primarily visual interest for the intersection. Uh, there's some slope enhancements and some new rock um, uh, terraces and trees, as well as some lighting and, and pedestrian improvement. So a relatively light treatment here um, related primarily to visual uh, interest in pedestrian safety. The former S-curve lands, this represents sort of the biggest uh, chunk of the, um, of the design and the plan moving forward and, and represents, I think it's important to state, a, a, an, um, uh, an addition to the original bridge scope. So uh, most of the work that is in this, this portion of it, and we can talk about that 
uh, a little bit um, through the discussion, uh, represents um, something that wasn't originally within the bridge scope, but represents an opportunity to create a new uh, people space on the waterfront. Uh, the redesign of the S-curve lands um, looks to, to act as a junction point for the Galloping Goose Trail, the West Song Walkway, the, e the ENN Trail, as well as the pedestrian and cycling connections across the bridge. Um, the aim is to provide a high quality park space with step seating, uh, landscape terraces, uh, those connected pathways. Um, ultimately, the vision for this sort of sees this as being a primary um, area for people as well as during festivals such as the fireworks. This is a key viewing point uh, for the city. This is actually one of the nicest viewing points um, in the city of the city. Uh, and so there's a real opportunity here from, from staff's perspective. Uh, the improved cycling and pedestrian connections are also a key element. The Northern Junk Plaza, so this is the plaza immediately adjacent to what is the proposed Northern Junk redevelopment. Um, the, you know, its primary aim here is a connection down to the future um, harbor pathway, um, but um, the design here aims also to provide for um, plaza, plaza spaces uh, the activated by potential retail within the future redevelopment, as well as um, step seating and other viewing points. Uh, the triangle green, this is the large triangle that, that currently exists, uh, can currently be uh, viewed within the um, um, Wharf Street and Johnson Pandora sort of triangle. Um, the, th this uh, area you know, uh, serves a significant pedestrian safety function, but also offers an opportunity for a gateway element um, uh, as folks enter the, the downtown core from Victoria West. Um, the aim, the, the, co the concept here is, is somewhat high level, uh, but does provide for enhanced landscaping, widened sidewalks, more formalized planting, as well as um, it has been identified as an opportunity for public art. In terms of the public art, the approach uh, that staff are recommending is to commission the city's artist in residence, Luke Ramsey, to create uh, a detailed proposal for a public art installation within the Triangle uh, Green location. Um, the aim is to have the, um, uh, our artist in residence work very closely with the project team um, in the detailed landscape design. The hope is that the uh, the landscape design, the final landscape design itself can become a sort of seamless part of the public art, uh, therefore sort of increasing the overall impact of, uh, of the art piece um, um, within its context. Um, the existing project budget includes $250,000 for public art, um, as, well, um, uh, as well as some of the landscaping costs, which would be above and beyond that. So in terms of costs and phasing, um, staff have broken up the, the different uh, areas into sort of three primary projects. So project one includes the Janion Plaza. Uh, while that is under construction and most of the work there is funded, uh, there are some portions of that work that are not, not, not funded um, and so therefore would need some additional funds to complete. The Triangle Green Park would be within project one. The Esquimalt intersection um, lands uh, set to an interim standard. Um, and the aim here is about a million dollars uh, based on the Class C cost estimate. Project two includes the new park, the former S curve lands, uh, with an estimated cost of about $4.4 million. Project three is the Northern Junk Plaza, uh, which requires some further design refinement uh, as well, uh, based largely on the outcomes of the, the design process with the developer adjacent. So based on that, what staff are recommending is to report back with an interim solution for projects one and two, but place project three, which is the Northern Junk <coughs> Plaza on hold, given the decisions still needing to be made by council on the development adjacent and the impact that might have. Uh, there are also potential opportunities through the rezoning and development process to identify oppor uh, opportunities for the d developer perhaps to provide um, funding for some portion of that, that space. Um, the rest of the recommendation says to consider the attached Johnson Street Bridge public realm final design as part of future budgeting processes. Um, <coughs> And so the interim solution for projects one and two would be funded through the reallocation of existing 2018 funding from Parks and Public Works and staff would report back on the details of that uh, in a subsequent report. Option two uh, would see the implementation of all of these elements in 2017. However, that would uh, require significant diversions of funds from other um, departmental budgets or potentially impact other programs. So it is not recommended. So there's the detail. I don't know if the council wants me to read the recommendation in detail. No, okay. So uh, uh, we're available for any questions. Thank you. Questions? Yes, um, Councillor uh, Alto, Councillor Isaac, Councillor Thornton Joe, and then I've got some. Uh, first, just a simple question. Can you just go back one slide? So um, my question, uh, just specifically on the order 
uh, when it says in option one, um, consider the attached Johnson's Street Bridge public realm final design as part of future budget processes, that doesn't imply, or does it imply, that what we have currently as a draft, we'll call it, um, is still open for change in part three. E even if we, I, what I want to know is if we adopt recommendation one, what has been presented as a potential for project three, what you've called project three, is really just a placeholder and we still have time to do more work on that. Is that right? Uh, potentially. I think, um, yeah, no, there, there, there's further refinements that would need to be done with that as part of the uh, negotiations with the adjacent developer, mm -hmm. as well as through the de detailed design process. And so, yes, there would be an opportunity to potentially revisit that, um, uh, that design in some way. That said, I think, um, you know, some, some key aspects of, of the, the concept as it's being proposed, uh, you know, there, there are some constraints on, on, on how many changes could be made. I'm confusing you. Okay, I might have an additional question I just sure. need to think about that. Thank you, uh, Councilor Isaac. Confused, the, the report and the agenda doesn't seem to reflect these recommendations. Can staff explain? Like there's recommendations. Because, uh, sorry, I might be thinking of another report. I'll let staff answer. I'm sorry, in, in, in what, what particular aspect? Well, I think what's at the end of the, I'm just opening it up now. At the beginning of the report, you have the recommendations. At the end of the report, you have only the other alternatives. So I think what's up at the top of the report matches what's on the screen. At, at the yeah. end of the report, yeah. staff have given the other ideas and haven't restated the original recommendation. Oh yeah, I'm just okay. looking at the top. So these ones, if we go to the previous slide, how does those two bullets in one, um, how are they incorporated into the slide we just saw? If we could maybe go back to the other one. So, so to prepare an interim design based on the final, the, the, the uh, concept plans um, for a minimum standard for the former S-curve lands, Esquibel Harbor uh, Road intersection, the Triangle Green, and the work to, required to re complete the Janion Plaza. So that re refers to the interim plan for, uh, for projects one and two. Put okay. the design for the Northern Junk Plaza on hold pending outcome of the Northern Junk rezoning application. That's the putting on hold project three. And then commission the city's artist and residents uh, to move forward with the uh, art for the, the design. So we would come back within, with a plan. Um, so the, the, the option two here is do it all as per the as per the concept. What we're recommending is not do it all as per the concept, but rather to do portions of it as per the concept within existing um, uh, sort of uh, uh, capital budgeting allocations and opportunities, and we'll come back with what that is. That likely would mean an interim standard for, uh, for the S-curve lands and some of these other elements that we will report back on um, with a plan for when the final portions of the S-curve lands and some of those other elements would be, would be um, implemented. Now, option two, where it says implement any of these areas, presumably we could do one of those areas within existing budget, couldn't we? Ms. Thompson? Uh, through Mayor Helps, uh, we would have to stop something else. Uh, so right now we have work plans already in place for 2017, and we are, we are, we're working towards uh, achieving all of those. If Council would like to redirect or make, have a stop something in 2017, obviously that's up to Council, but that might be a little bit more difficult, uh, especially since we would like to do a little bit more planning and try to figure out how we would refine this and then bring it back as part of 2018. So this, so no work would happen in any of these sites until 2018, or what would happen under option one here? Uh, if approved, the um, uh, pre pre pending the outcome of the, the, the budgeting process and, the re and some of the reallocation process, um, I, I would anticipate that some of the completion work on the Janion Plaza would move forward. Potentially some, some initial works on the Triangle Plaza could occur. Most of the work on the S-curve lands can't really occur until um, mid-2018 anyway um, because we need to open up the new bridge and start to dismantle the, um, uh, the old bridge prior to any sort of major works um, being, being undertaken. So uh, I think the, the, the fastest that work on the southwest corner could occur um, would be sort of mid-2018, which, which gives opportunity for council to review this through the budgeting process. Okay, and specific to the uh, the S curve lands, what's proposed for the grade um, and protection of the rail corridor and the grade of the rail corridor? 
I'll just go back here so we can see. So the if, uh, if if council views the the, the grade um, through to this this location, the the rail corridor uh, ends at this location, um, and so provisions have been made within the design to to provide for the potential for a future uh, station, perhaps uh, if that were to to come about. But that's the 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 intent of this, and the um, uh, is not to allow for or the, the direction has not been to allow for the the rail to continue through. Um, this into downtown that, that I believe that was abandoned at some point in the past but in terms of reducing costs for a future connection to downtown I'm wondering what's proposed to happen with the existing grade because there is well, basically incrementally soils have kind of been removed and we've lost that grade and it essentially is a, a liability for a future capital project so just wondering what the proposed finished grade is for Essentially, right where it says S curve lands, and then that pathway, right, which is the the rail bed, and the so those those grades are defined largely by what's underneath, which are a number a, a fair amount of contaminated soil, and so one of the drivers for the design in the in the park space here was uh, the capping of that contaminated soil and the creation of usable people space on top of soils mm -hmm. that are uh, relatively expensive and and challenging to to remove, um, and so again the the. The design brief and the draft and, and the, the grades that were agreed to as part of the bridge project, uh, which this builds off of, uh, don't anticipate a, a rail connection continuing through, uh, through here into, into the downtown core. So that would have to be a future consideration with some, some broader uh, thinking attached to it. Yeah, I guess my comments, I'm not suggesting you put rail on it. It's just retaining as much of the grade, which seems to address the issues of future rail, rail connectivity, but also cost containment. Because the more soil we have sitting there and the less soil we remove, that has the added benefit of having something approaching a, a, a satisfactory grade for a future rail alignment. Yeah, I don't believe we're removing significant amounts of soil. Again, we're, we're limited in our ability to do that because of the contamination of those soils. And so the, the grades that, the, that uh, are provided here for this uh, for the for the park are actually built around those contaminated soils, which which are largely uh, left as uh, in, in situ. So again, I think you know, notwithstanding future decisions, the the, the previous decision was not to um, and based on the grading was not to provide for um, connectivity through. However, there is a provision within the, the grading of the plan to provide for a potential future station uh, if the, the rail does end up coming this far uh, to the to the west or to the east. The other issue there was this idea of a, uh, a connection to Esquimalt Road from the, the trestle. So basically from that connection where the two pedestrian cycling bridges are coming, or to the left, yep. uh, a bit farther to the left. Yeah, right there, to be able to drop down onto the bridge, basically, if there was a cyclist coming on the ENN rail trail yes. and wanting to get on the roadway, because the roadway is going to be more convenient. Yes, and that that is that is provided here through the uh, through this drop down over here. So uh, the grades the grades here and the abutment underneath that bridge are much too steep to to provide for anything but a staircase. Right. Um, and so the the, uh, the the drawings here allow for pedestrian access up from the sidewalk uh, to this level, as well as potential um, um, bike access down from this level to the roadway uh, to continue across on the roadway. So that is a, that is a provision of the design. It, it so where would you where would the bike go down? Because it's hard to see. I don't see a connection <coughs> right there. But the, and is that connected to to the sidewalk to the upper it, plaza or? Yes, like, this, this is this is a slope across here. Okay. So the this is essentially a switchback that drops from this upper uh, okay. walkway down to the the roadway. Okay. Hopefully, in the next iteration of the designs, we could see that a bit more clearly of. Um, so I think Councillor Young's point that he's made repeatedly when this item's come up is well taken, that there's going to be people coming from Vic West, Esquimalt, everywhere else who are going to want to get onto the bridge deck and proceed to wherever they're going down. And I think this design yeah. modification was made in response to Councillor Young's repeated requests for it, yes. if that's my remembering. Yes? yes. Last question relates to the, the, uh, the Northern Junk uh, project. What's the anticipated timeline for an application coming to council? 
Well, the application is currently in front of council. However, our understanding from the developer is that they've had some, uh, they've had to make some changes with their design team uh, who are getting back up to speed. Um, they've they've um, uh, reached out to us recently that they're hoping to um, provide a resubmission of their application based on some changes that, uh, that staff uh, had indicated they needed to make um, uh, probably sometime within the next month if if all goes well um, and so that um, uh, that consideration could uh, can move forward from there they 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 've been uh, currently undertaking their their designs and they were part of the original workshop so the concept here for this plaza in terms of the the grading and the connection in um, they they 're um, responding to the that general sort of design within their design uh, that said those things could be refined through um, uh, through the rezoning process as we go forward. Sure. Um, in terms of the, the setback uh, and massing that's shown for that potential building, um, is that based on the current zoning or what, um, what criteria? It seems like it essentially has a zero lot line, essentially a vertical wall running up from the lot line. I'm just wondering what, where that information came from. Well, that, that's based on their current proposal. So the, their current proposal in front of council is still still to be considered, and again, that's that's part of the rationale for holding off on on further design uh, of this space, because council may may direct the developer to do uh, to make changes or, or uh, undertake revisions that would have an impact on this, or you know, potentially council could could turn down the application altogether, in which case uh, there may be a different uh, thinking on on how we conceive of this. That said, the, uh, my understanding is that the, um, um, there are some portions of the massing of the tower in the current proposal that do extend up from the plaza. However, some portion, there are some setbacks. However, those setbacks are designed to, to uh, live seamlessly with the plaza so that it's difficult to uh, sort of tell where one ends and one's be one begins, which is uh, sort of uh, preferred practice in most of these cases. And are there any images in this presentation that show the, the proposed building? No, we've kept it mostly ghosted out. Um, sure. There's a sort of a, um, uh, so you get a feel for it in terms of the massing uh, there. But again, I think this is, uh, this is based on the previous uh, proposal. And so there may be further changes when they resubmit. And certainly this is something, the, the relationship between the building and the massing here versus, uh, and its impact on that public space is certainly something that council can take into consideration as part of their, uh, their consideration of the proposal. And then also on the foreshore, even thinking about this green shores, because um, one of the illustrations in the, the, the agenda essentially showed, showed that building jutting out, whereas right now it's a, a natural shoreline. And we do have uh, correspondence from the applicant from, I think, 2008 or 2009, uh, committing to a generous setback and replacing green space that they're proposing to build on um, with the, an equivalent amount of green space on the foreshore, and that doesn't seem to be reflected in the, the drawings that, that were in this public realm plan. I don't have that in my, uh, you, you know, again, I, I, we don't have that in, in, in front of us here. We can certainly consider that, but I think the, the primary area for that consideration would be the rezoning uh, process. The, you know, the, there, there is no sort of green foreshore um, in the areas that the, the plaza, the public, public plaza um, um, addresses. The, 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 the foreshore portion of the public plaza is actually the existing bridge abutment. Um, and so that there, there's a limitation on the ability for a naturalized shoreline in that particular location. Mm -hmm. um, and so again, if there are opportunities for a more naturalized shoreline along the frontage of the northern junk development, that's, that's something that can be considered through that rezoning application. Okay. Mr. Johnson? Yeah, and that's why staff made the recommendation that this be put on hold given the pending considerations and the different iterations that we'll go through or that council will go through in consideration of the application. So it's premature to start discussing setbacks and things of, the, of that nature for a development that hasn't uh, been in front of council at this time and will be shortly. Thank you. Councillor Thornton Joe, question? <clears throat> Thank you. Um, my questions and concerns are, and I think I've mentioned before, are, are in relation to the Janion Plaza um, due to a letter received from one of the um, people that were involved with, with, with some of the design, mm -hmm. uh, who's the landscape uh, architect, which is Bev Win Winjack, and, and also the concerns of the Northern Junk uh, um, area. Uh, would, uh, expressing the concerns of the the uh, DRA, the Victoria uh, Resident Association. So with the, the Janion, um, 
the Genyan Plaza uh, on, I guess, page five of the report. It talks about it being part of project one uh, and looking at completion of the Genyan Plaza, the Triangle Green and Esquimalt intersection. And when it comes to um, that there'll be interim plan and report back to council, full design will need consideration as part of a future budget process. So, so my question regarding that one is uh, there has been expression that uh, uh, the original design that uh, seemed to be supported um, has been whether scaled down or changed because of uh, budget concerns. And some of the comments is that uh, these changes no longer reflect the intentions, uh, not appropriate gateway, does not provide livability, eco uh, ecology, or beauty. Um, so, so these concerns are, are expressed. So when we look at full design, will there be opportunity to incorporate some of those concerns uh, with the budget uh, ask? And will we be going too far to one direction to, to not be able to uh, address uh, some of those concerns? Yeah. So, so uh, the, those concerns expressed are, are, are based on a misunderstanding. So the, the design that has been moved forward and the issued for construction drawings for the Janion Plaza are the ones that were developed by, by Ms. Winjack and, and, and her, her group. What, uh, what has occurred is that the, the designs for that, has, or the construction has been phased. So the construction that is, that is currently underway and currently funded uh, goes up to um, where we have available uh, capital dollars in order to complete. So certain aspects have been put on hold, subject to Council's direction for uh, pot potentially for additional funding coming out of this process. So uh, the, the design is as per what was uh, provided. Um, it's funded partially through the, the, the remaining landscape budget for the bridge, as well as a contribution by the developer uh, adjacent. But there are certain aspects such as lighting, uh, the trees, the benches, um, the final, the sort of very final landscaping elements, which are on hold. All of the infrastructure to install them has been put in place. Um, however, the final uh, um, uh, budget allocation to actually pay for them and put them in will, will, like, will be directed coming out of this process. So that's, the, the Janion Plaza will move forward as per the designs that were developed. That's uh, assuming that Council uh, is in, a, in approval of the recommendation and, and provides for funding to, to do that completion. So when you refer to the designs, I understand there was an original design and then there were uh, design revisions. So are you referring to the original design or design? Um, Again, I, I believe this is based a bit on, on, under a misunderstanding. So the, okay. there was an original design in the, uh, in the package um, that, um, for the bridge package uh, several years ago. That was revised through this process and um, provided to, um, to Ms. Winjack for a final, for, for development of, com, um, issued for construction drawings. Her concern is that her design is not being built, and my my sort of message is subject to council approving the uh, required funds, um, and it's a rel it's a relatively small um, amount to, for completion. Um, that that will be built as per the drawings that that, that she did. We we feel that those are strong. We feel that those create uh, an active and and uh, livable space in that area, and certainly the developer is very keen uh, to see that that the, that work completed, and are uh, looking at a. Um, uh, a tenant into that space who will um, hopefully utilize the the plaza space as a as an and activate it with um, with patio seating and other things. So we're that 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 is uh, that is looking to move forward. That's great. Okay, and <clears throat> so my understanding is that there was a misunderstanding. You've had a discussion with yes. uh, Ms. Winjack to to uh, clarify that. Okay, yep. thank you. So the second piece is the uh, northern junk uh, section, and I and I understand that of course uh, without the application fully approved, there may be some changes and, and um, but I guess when I read the report and when I read the letter from uh, the Downtown Res Association, uh, one of the things that seems to be clear is that they spent many years uh, planning without uh, considering that there needed to, to be a roadway for traffic for uh, city, I guess city trucks. Uh, and so the frustration now is that we're, they're told that the design that they worked and put hours in for, for many years um, is having, having to be changed uh, to address uh, the, the movement of vehicles and no longer uh, meets uh, what their, their, their goals were. Mm -hmm. So my question is, you know, did we not, 
how, how did it come about that we weren't aware of this uh, need for a driveway or, or, or truck access? When did we find out that uh, there was a need? And is there an opportunity to have the committee come back and to rethink what the design might be if they were to consider uh, th this vehicle access? And is this vehicle access needed in such a way that, uh, like, is it going to be needed quite often, or is it something that's so temporary that uh, we might not have to, to put that in? So <clears throat> I, I can only speak to when, when this process began. But yes, when, we're, when we undertook the charrette process with the, um, uh, with the Downtown Residents Association as well as some of the other, the other users, um, there was definitely some consensus that came out to a particular design approach. And that approach, and it's difficult to show it here, but that approach really means that the accessible access from the, the upper plaza down to the lower um, walkway uh, is a sort of a, 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 a switchback uh, sort of portion. And that was really, that, that was the primary focus. And, and I think, you know, it, it often happens in these design processes where a particular, a particular design solution is, is sort of uh, gravitated around by the different public um, uh, folks uh, participating in that process. I think uh, subsequent to that, uh, coming out of that process, and we were very clear with folks when we, when we undertook that process, that when you're drawing stuff on trace paper in a charrette process, you know, the width of a, the width of a Sharpie pen is, is five, six meters. And so that these um, designs would need to be refined. But that, what we also did through that process was identify a set of principles that these spaces needed to meet. Uh, so that we weren't getting specifically plugged into one or another design solutions, but were rather trying to meet key principles. The old design for this space was really a very wide ramp that extended almost from, from edge to edge and connected down to, to the water. It was paved largely all the way across. It was a roadway that connected down to, and, and that was in response to the idea at the time that the David Foster pathway would be a bike pathway as well. Changes in the way we thought about the pathway, as well as some of those um, um, parks uh, and, and, and public works operating considerations in terms of being able to access the pathway for maintenance, as well as being able to access uh, these planted areas for maintenance, really sort of drove the, the uh, return to a ramp. However, it returns to a ramp that is about three and a half to four meters wide, not one that takes up this entire space. That allows for the main maintenance of a significant amount, as you see in this, this rendering here, a significant amount of planted uh, green space. That planted green space needs to be pushed to this side of the, the site so that it's not uh, stuck in shadow uh, most of the time. But so we were able to provide for that, allow for accessible access as well as um, periodic uh, vehicle access down to the, the waterfront walkway, but also create a significant amount of people space at the top in terms of the, um, the op an open air plaza, as well as opportunities for, for se uh, additional seating on the staircase. And we're also, through this design, able to create a larger uh, space at the, the base. And so what we did is, is staff worked through and, did, and with their landscape architect worked through a bit of analysis and identified sort of the, the proportion of this space that was um, that is green planted space, the proportion that is open public plaza, and the proportion that is um, um, sort of ramp and, and circulation, and compared that to the switchback that the DRA is, is, uh, is, is um, uh, committed to, uh, and with this one. And there are some changes, but this, this design meets about 90% of the, the principles in terms of providing that space that that switchback option um, uh, provides. And so I think, again, while I understand that, that, that certain stakeholders have a particular design solution they've had in mind, uh, when we bring to bear all of those, the constraints and the maintenance issues and all the other things that the city has to provide, our, our hope is that we have met that. And we've had a meeting with the DRA, and I, I don't know if we've necessarily convinced them um, that this is the way to go. But that said, I think um, the, the, these considerations are ones that we need to make uh, part of the design. They are constraints that we need to manage. And so our hope is that this space will perform and meet their principles the same way that the, the design solution they've directed themselves to. And I guess my concern is not to convince them, but to work with them to, to sort of uh, meet in a, to a certain degree. Um, so my last question is, uh, one of the concerns expressed is the uh, lack of usable green space. Can you uh, give me a better indication of what would be considered usable green space uh, that is in, in this area? So I see the... Uh, you know, the, the hardscape and, and the opportunity for the path. Uh, but uh, the, the concern is a lot of the green space is, is there to look at, but not to be able to be used, and may even block some of the view, for example, of the bridge. 
Um, so I, I, there's a, there's a, we had a bit of a discussion with them about the, the idea of usable green space, and, and I understand the, the need for it, and certainly there are, um, uh, this is a, a, an issue that keeps raising uh, it, its head within the downtown core, and we understand that. I think the key consideration from a design perspective is what, what can this space be used for? Um, in terms of usable green space, you know, this is not uh, this is not a location that is going to respond well to large uh, swaths of lawn. It has a fair amount of grade. It needs to provide for that connection uh, up and down. This space, uh, excuse me, uh, here, um, you know, potentially that could be grass instead of paver. That said, it's on the uh, north side of of a potentially a, a development site, and therefore um, would not be would not be one where that grass is going to live and, and thrive in, in any sort of major way. So when we take into account shading, when we take into account uh, some of the adjacent uses, the grade, this is not necessarily going, you know, a place that is amenable to uh, to picnicking, to, to children playing, to any sort of sports activities. Um, the addre addressing some of that is really sort of looking more at the overall context and so when we look at this space here in terms of providing for that sort of passive respite, the walking, the, 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 um, the, the um, sticking around, the throwing a Frisbee, yes, I understand that this, the S-curve land park is in Vic West, that it crosses a boundary. Um, but we did a quick analysis, and you know, about half of the residents in the downtown core are within a 10-minute walk of this space. And this space has sun, it has, it has scale, it has grade that works significantly better for useful green space than, than this space, which is, um, you know, sort of uh, would be a challenging site to provide for that kind of provision. So again, those constraints are ones I understand that uh, certain stakeholders uh, have, a, have a commitment that they're looking to, to meet there. Um, but whether it's the S-curve lands or the, the consideration for ship point, um, those are the places I think where we can provide some usable green space. This is a tough one to, to be able to really meet that principle. Thanks. Thank you for now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I've got a couple of questions. Can we go back to the very first slide in the presentation? Uh, the second slide, I guess. Is that to scale? Sorry, I'm thinking yeah. that is so much pavement. <laughs> Um, yes, it is. Uh, that, that would be generally to scale, although there's probably some perspective, uh, skew some perspective because this is in the front of the, the foreground and this is in the background. Um, however, that, that said, that is, uh, that is a fair bit. The, the, the on and off uh, movements to and from the bridge uh, do require a fair amount of, of vehicle space. I mean, I'll, I'll defer to my, my colleague in engineering, but, uh, but there are some, uh, some significant vehicle um, um, constraints on that corridor. Okay, that's fine. Um, my second question is with regard to quote unquote triangle green. Um, can we uh, also, and again, this will maybe come more through the motion, but can we also give the artists and residents the direction to name it something? Because <laughs> triangle green is just a bit lackluster. So I guess that, is that just a placeholder name that you're using, and could we consider naming that green space as part of this project? I, I'm, I'm not, uh, no one's given, uh, given us direction to name it, so yes, that is just a placeholder. Sorry, I, I, I can't hear. I, I heard you, Councillor Alto. Maybe I'll just, I, I, couldn't under, I couldn't hear you at the same time I was listening to him. Um, but maybe you can bring that up when we discuss. Um, uh, next question is to our Director of Finance. Um, it's a little bit pushy, but um, we have a parks acquisition fund. Can we use it to um, build parks that we already own? Can it, so could part of that be, to, it's a new park, the S-curve lands. Could part of that be deployed to quote unquote acquire a park, as in put it there? Um, Mayor Helps, I actually looked into that already, and acquire means to buy. Um, and so the short answer to that is no. Darn. Um, we would need okay. a development fund. Yeah. All right, no problem. Um, that's all, uh, those are all my questions. Uh, are there other questions? Yes, uh, Councillor Lucas was next, actually, sorry, and then Councillor Madoff. Thank you. Um, I had a question about uh, moving forward after we, if we decide to go forward with this, we've, um, you've noted here that the annual maintenance on this is 300000 a year between the two departments. That seems fairly significant. Um, and knowing that we just went through uh, a fairly extensive budget, there was no money left over. So how, how do we, when we're making our decision here, knowing that we've got to move forward with that kind of um, investment in the maintenance of it, is this a doable in this, in between these two departments? And if so, what has to be removed? Mr. Uh, Soulier, everyone's looking at you. Oh. <laughs> 
I was going to defer to my colleague, the Director of Finance, because it really is a matter for the uh, for the budget process um, when we were developing the budget for 2018. Uh, we've looked at the, the drawings, uh, the details that have been provided to date and, and come up with a, an estimate. Um, but again, coming back with uh, a more robust uh, strategy and, uh, and certainly the operational funding will be part of the 2018 budget and beyond. Mr. Johnson? It's precisely these sorts of ads when we're putting them together um, that have a cumulative effect in terms of uh, the level of service that we're able to provide without adding those additional FTEs and operational items that go along with it. That's why we're recommending that um, this be done through the budget process rather than in isolation so that Council can look at the various priorities that we've got, um, not only with the Johnson Street Bridge, but other priorities within the city um, without one-offing them um, and not being able to see what that totality of the budget exercise looks like. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, Councillor Madoff and then Councillor Loveday with questions. <clears throat> Thank you. I think what we're trying to establish, hopefully through our questions, is, uh, and certainly I am, I'm trying to really understand if we support this motion, what do we actually get? And I think it's quite complicated to try to understand that in, in, reading, the, in reading the report. So I want to go back to, um, if you can just clarify the amount, the dollar amount that was originally budgeted for the public realm aspects of the bridge project. I'd like to give you, if you may help, sir, a simple answer, but let me let me try and make this as simple as possible. There was a cash allowance in the contract of eight hundred and eighty thousand dollars, which has now been expended, and I, I won't bore you with the details, but I can give you a detailed breakdown of where that went. In addition to which, there is public realm work within the current PCL contract. For example, on, and that's a decision that at some point I have to work with the city manager to decide how we're going to deal with this. So on the S-curve lands, uh, PCL are required in their existing contract and existing funding to take the elevation of that area down to uh, level three, meaning three meters above the water level, the, the high tide level, and put in a paved plaza area. So obviously that isn't what we want and the question I have to work out is do we tell them to do the work anyway because not, not particularly pointing at PCL, it applies with any contract, getting credit for deleting work is never, you never get 100% of the money back. And so the question is do I tell them to go ahead and then do it in such a way that it's useful work that we've already paid for? And the same applies on the southeast side where, uh, we've, uh, but where PCL have to take that area down from 10 meters above um, uh, the datum down to 5 meters. And uh, there's, a, there's obviously they have to demolish the abutments at each end and take that away. There's a lot of fill. The only thing we would be liable for is is to dispose of that fill, but we've reason to believe it's clean fill and we can use it elsewhere or see if somebody else wants the fill or we can sell it. So that, that's a, uh, hopefully that's a, a reasonable answer mm -hmm. to you. Yep, thank you. And going back to the, um, the first presentation that we had from the uh, original landscape architects, and I remember at the time, I'm, my comment was that I found it rather disappointing. And the explanation was, is all that they were doing was providing a framework and that that would be filled in over time. And so I'm trying to understand where are we with this concept in terms of that framework and where are we with in terms of starting to fill in that framework? Conceptually, I'd say we're filling in that framework. I think we're filling in that framework as, as, uh, and then some. So I think, you know, um, Mr. Huggett's... Uh, uh, you know, comments around sort of uh, some of those elements in the S-curve lands. You know, there are some aspects of this that are uh, weren't considered as part of the original bridge project because they were, you know, we were looking at building a bridge project. Subsequent to that construction and, and, and things moving forward, we've identified new opportunities. So within the S-curve lands, 
The original project really only sort of looked at a portion on this side. You know, all of this represents sort of a new opportunity for the city, and that's that's sort of uh, reflected in the in in staff's recommendation of looking at this as a as sort of a multi-year sort of phased approach, because this is this isn't specific to the bridge. It's an opportunity created by the bridge, but it isn't specific to the bridge project. It's not required as part of the bridge project, and so um, so yes, the, there was a framework that was created initially. We filled that in, um, but I would say that that framework was based around a more utilitarian approach to these spaces, and so you know again creating opportunities for the city and you know creating city building opportunities by looking at these spaces and how we can activate them how we can create um, people spaces here as opposed to um, uh, s simply meeting some functional or utilitarian requirements and that's that's the sort of main difference uh, between the sort of original um, approach and then this approach and right, mr johnson just wanted to add something yeah, go so ahead just if i can quickly add for for council this was uh, one of the risks that we've identified throughout uh, the project in terms of there will be additional costs coming forward as we complete the framework that was put into place through the contract. So Mr. Huggett will often say, no problem, I can grade it and hydro seed it and it's done. That's not the expectation of council for that area. So what council is wrestling with is how do we phase this? How do we put this in in an affordable way while meeting the objectives of um, what was contemplated for the bridge project? And that's why we've brought forward these options for council so that we can slowly move towards that um, while finding opportunities with um, the Northern Junk, uh, who haven't had that filled in yet, to get closer to what this concept is providing. So, you know, that's what we've been working on very diligently is to meet the expectation. But I think it's very difficult for council to flip the switch and do it all at once, uh, given what the funding considerations are and the other priorities that we've got in terms of fire hall, crystal pool, um, and building reserves um, that we've had to deplete as a result of this project. And that's why it's so important to consider this within the entire budget perspective so that council can meet all of the objectives and, and not just one off, whether it's this or whether it's the cultural master plan or the uh, uh, parks master plan so that you can look at it in its totality. And, and that's what we're trying to do with this recommendation is give council that ability. Councillor Madoff, follow-up yes. question? Yes, and then would it be an accurate characterization going back to that notion of a, of, of a basic framework that the $880,000 has paid for that framework to be done and now we're working on the, the special elements and the addition of the S-curve development and that kind of thing? Mr. Huggett, I know you can't give us a laundry list of the $880,000, but can you give us a sense of some of what ha that has been spent on? Not, like, sure. It, thank you. Uh, it, and, and it's a relatively short list. Uh, so $330,000 was spent on landscape lighting. $388,000 was a contribution towards the Janian Plaza, which had never been anticipated to the extent that it was going to be done. That wasn't all the cost. We additionally took other money out of the um, contingency that you have to fund that. I think the total cost of the Janian Plaza to date is about $700,000. And then, uh, so the Janian Plaza landscaping is certainly a big part of it. The landscape lighting is, uh, and again, even on the Janian Plaza, so there's a retaining wall for 44000 Um some of the landscaping of the approaches that you've seen has been 70, uh, well, nearly $80,000. Uh, so we have, the, the $880,000 is accounted for, and additionally, uh, I've spent $321,000 already from the contingency that council has approved uh, to cover off other um, issues that had to be done. So for example, as you can imagine, when we're building things, if we're gonna put irrigation in, I, I need to do it when we're in the ground. It's no good waiting till we finished it all and then go and dig it all up to go and put irrigation in. So I'll put stubs in that we can hook back to easily or, or put the minimum in. I, that's not to say I've done all the work, but I didn't want to be in the situation of coming back to you and saying, oh, I've got to dig it all up again because we didn't put certain services in. Thank you. And the clarification that I need, I think most importantly, uh, is the specificity of language in terms of what we're being asked and what it's describing and what's the wording in the recommendation is somewhat different from what I've read in the report. So it talks about um, doing part within the concept and that's what we'd be funding is doing part of the concept. But then there's another statement where it says to that we would be 
um, instituting an interim design with a minimum standard of finish versus a degree of finishing the project. So are we instituting minimum finishes that will have to be redone or you know, which, which is the actual, act, uh, you know, what actually captures what we'll be doing if we approve this? <laughs> So the, the approval today is, uh, is, is largely uh, an approval of the, the conceptual package uh, as, a sort of a, as a sort of a visioning document and a direction for, for staff to go away and come back with those specific details. Um, and, you know, I think it, it's reflective of how we want to sort of do some of these kinds of projects, which is let's identify what it is we want to achieve uh, in the long term and then uh, identify for council what the steps are to get there. Because the intent is that, you know, uh, we want to create things that are cumulative. And so the so to answer your question, Councillor, what we would co come back with is an interim standard on some of these elements based on the available funding that we think we can uh, uh, we can. Um, reallocate reasonably within the short term, but we would undertake that work in such a way so that we don't have to tear things up in the future. So we're trying to look at this from a, uh, from a phased and staged approach so that, you know, uh, so that we're getting to the, the future that we want to. We're just not doing it all at once. We're doing a, taking a cumulative approach that gets to uh, something that feels like the, the, um, the, the detailed design you see in front of you. We, we did it to a detailed concept, though, so that Council has an understanding at this stage of what, are, what, what the overall costs may be. That said, we're not asking you to uh, approve those costs specifically today. That will be uh, something we come back to you with with more detail on the specific interim standard. Uh, may it helps if I can just add to that. I mean, w one example would be if you look at the S-curve lands and you'll see a pile of dirt out there now, which has been graded off and, and fenced. Now, it, it depends on when you decide you want to move forward. You can't leave that all through next winter and the erosion. So if council said, uh, we're not going to do this till 2019, 2020, I would probably ask the city manager if he would agree to me topsoiling and hydroseeding that area. Now, of course, if we then moved ahead, that would be work that you would rip up again. So it's those kinds of interim decisions. And it, I know I've said to PCL, they've asked me for direction on a number of issues. And I've said, until I hear what council wants to do, there are some areas I can't give you direction. I don't want to spend a whole lot of your money doing work that's then going to get ripped apart. But there are some things that if you're not going to move ahead on, that I do need to do something about them. Mm -hmm. And I can understand that certainly with those with the the S curve lands and the the, the 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 piles of soil and that kind of thing. So is it again? I just want to be really accurate when I'm speaking to this issue. Is it a um, a sense that will it'll be partially finished to a minimum standard, or is or will there be any elements coming out of this recommendation that would actually be finished to a final standard? Um, based on this recommendation, certainly the, the uh, Janion Plaza will be done to a finished standard. That would be uh, some key direction that would come out of that. Well, we would come back to Council with, again, with the approach for the, uh, the Triangle Park. Now there is a portion of that um, that is funded, you know, the, the public art piece is funded through already through the, through the budget. So we would look to, to um, um, provide for, for Council in the follow-up with, with what that is. And then on the S-Curve Lands uh, and the Esquimalt Road intersection, um, we would come back with, based on based on a you know a reasonable a reasonable sort of budget ask within say 2018. This is what we think we can do in 2018, and these are the things that we think we can do coming after that. So we would we will be able to. Uh, be able to provide a bit more detail about how that will phase in and, and be structured in, mm -hmm. um, and, and and definitely give council an understanding of what would be done by sort of uh, uh, you know after the the removal of the the existing bridge, um, and so that that direction can be provided. The, the key here is really to get council's stamp on this is the direction we want to be going. And help you understand what the the, um, the scope of the overall project is. Get council's confirmation that, that this is where we want to go, and we'll come back with those details. Mm -hmm. And just finally, and following up on a question that the that the mayor brought forward, and it was the uh, the amount of paving, the appearance of paving. And early on, one of the comments that went to the the, the landscape architects, particularly on the west side, was the um, with the removal of the S curve and everything else that. The hope was it was not going to look like a freeway coming into downtown Victoria and what landscape interventions could be put in place 
in order to soften that, even though physically you'd still have the same amount of paving. But what could we do with trees and, and interplanting and that kind of thing? And you know, as we're experiencing it now, I'm, I'm struggling to see what is it going to be that's going to start to soften that sense that you're not on a, a freeway as you come down uh, Esquimalt Road. So are there more things to come that we haven't seen? So the scope given for this project largely stayed within the roadway, um, within the existing curb alignments that were agreed within the contract. Um, that said, there, you know, there has been a fair amount of work that's been done um, on the Esquimalt Road section with the um, uh, with the Harbour Road intersection, uh, as well as with the the uh, pedestrian and bike bridge, uh, to integrate the those elements and soften those elements and create a bit of a gateway from those elements through the um, through the landscape design process. Um, I think. You know the comment that the mayor made about um, um, the scope on. Oops, sorry, let me go back. Um, the scope on the uh, downtown side of the bridge. Again, there's a there's a fair amount of of uh, roadway there. The the scope of of this work really stayed. Again, it stayed within these alignments here, looking largely at those people spaces. It, there wasn't a lot of time spent in in sort of the interior and portion of the roadway. That is that that's that's part of the existing contract. Um, that said, we could, you know, this council could provide direction in the detailed design for uh, for the Northern Junk Plaza, you know, uh, to work with transportation and see if there are further opportunities to uh, to sort of minimize that uh, that portion. I, 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 uh, that, that would be for council's direction. Thank you. Thank you. I have Councillor Loveday and then back to Councillor Thornton Joe with questions. Councillor Loveday, go ahead. Yeah, that, <clears throat> that actually answered a lot of my questions. It's sort of the process of how we got here, and so that was helpful. Thank you so much. Councillor Thornton Joe. <clears throat> Just, uh, thank you. Just a question about the public art. Um, I know that in the original discussion, uh, there was a budget for the public art, and I and I can't remember, was it a year ago or so, we had a subsequent, um, I think, motion of whether uh, to postpone the the public art to, uh, after the bridge is, is completed, or I'm, I can't remember. I don't know if anyone here can refresh my memory. I thought uh, uh, we were deferring that as, uh, aspect, and I don't know whether this this is that where we're at now or... Is, is there a reminder of a previous motion that we made Thompson? Over a year ago? Yeah. Um, through Mayor Hopes, I, I believe what happened at that point, we were looking at different funding sources for different, um, we had different options before Council on how we could fund other elements, and public art was one item that could be eliminated. Um, and at that point, Council decided that no, uh, that wasn't going to happen at that time, and then we would bring it back at a later date. I would suggest that now we do have some uh, plans on how we can actually spend this money, and, and unless Council would like to not do public art, um, uh, we, we are at a point where we could actually initiate that process. Thank you. I think it was just a, a clarity of uh, remembering having some form of a motion and discussion about the public art and making sure that uh, we weren't bringing for a motion that went against a previous motion. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I see no further questions. Staff, thank you for your report. Um, Mr. Coates, I'll ask for you to put the recommendation on the screen, and I will ask Council if anyone would like to move the staff recommendation. Thank you. Moved by Councillor Alto, seconded by Councillor Lucas. Um, Councillor Alto, I know you have an amendment, so why don't we just go right to that, and then we can have the motion as amended discussed by the Council. Sure. I actually have two amendments which I've shared with Council and with Mr. Coates. Uh, the first one deals with 2C. Uh, and it's just the addition of some words. Uh, it would read the Commission of the City of Victoria's Artists in Residence and Indigenous Artists in Residence as the artists, plural, uh, and the rest of it is the same. Okay, moved by Councillor Alto, seconded by Councillor Isaac. Just very, very briefly yeah, go ahead. Uh, on that, uh, it's, you know, we have gone to the trouble of, uh, of um, soliciting and appointing an Indigenous Artist in Residence, and I think that this is a particularly uh, enormous opportunity for us to uh, include that individual in anticipating what an art project might look like for this. And I think that in, as part of that conversation, uh, we could certainly uh, include the opportunity to consider potential naming as well as uh, something that would be compatible with that art. So I think given the, the year of reconciliation in which we are working, uh, this seems to me a, a, a relevant and uh, useful opportunity to add in this joint uh, joint joint work for both of our artists and residents. Thank you. Any further discussion? All those in favor of the amendment? Any opposed? Okay, Councillor Alta, your second amendment? Yes, the second amendment, which I also shared, um, refers to Section 2B. 
And that, uh, I'll just read it and then I'll speak briefly to it. Again, it's very minor, but it adds additional wording, and that would be uh, in the second part of it where it says, following which further design refinements and public engagement will be undertaken. Okay, moved and seconded. And just to speak to that, I mean, I think many of the questions that we had uh, today specific to this area uh, indicated a concern that, uh, particularly in light of the fact that we don't know what the Northern Junk proposal might look like, that it's premature to anticipate uh, very much further uh, what this area uh, might include from the perspective of public space. And so I, I agree with the uh, notion that has been put forward in the main motion that we should wait until that proposal is, is before us and we have a chance to see uh, what is being um, suggested. At the same time, I think it's important for us to ensure that when we have that information, that we include uh, the public uh, as, as much as possible and reasonable in the relatively short time that I'm sure we'll have uh, to, in the conversation about what that could and should look like in relation to the Northern Junk uh, proposal and in relation to um, the rest of the open space uh, development that we'll be talking about between now and then. So uh, this to me, you know, I, I appreciate the fact that there's been a lot of conversation already. Uh, and that's great, and it certainly uh, has uh, informed to a certain extent where we are now. But I think given the potential impact of the Northern Junk proposal uh, and the importance of this particular space uh, to the downtown neighborhood, that we need to make sure that that door remains open uh, once we have a continuing discussion and that uh, subsequent information. So I'm, I'm hopeful that folks will support this addition as well. Thank you. Discussion on the amendment? Councillor thornton Joe. Uh, just a question. With my understanding that the uh, public engagement would include uh, involvement of uh, stakeholders as well, St. Ep. So just, okay, I just want, when you said just reaching out to the public, I just want to make sure stakeholders uh, will have the opportunity to bring come at the table and have that, uh, those their concerns uh, discussed. Mr. Tinney. Uh, absolutely. That, you know, certainly there's, there's, uh, obvious benefit to that I just, just as a background the, the the this particular space and the options for this space both those preferred by some of the stakeholders as well as the option put forward here was has been engaged upon uh, certainly that went out to the public and, and there was actually a relatively um, um, sort of even split on the different options that were put forward so it is um, notwithstanding the the opportunity to to um, engage further on any revisions or refinements to it that are derived from the northern junk just want to provide that as background Thank you. All of those in favor of the amendment? Any opposed? Okay, thank you. Yes, go ahead. Um, so just briefly on, on the, the totality of it, I, I think that I'm reassured by the fact that there are, are to my reading anyway, in my understanding, a, a variety of different opportunities uh, in the coming time to uh, have an ongoing conversation about the development of all of these areas. Uh, I'm able to support this in general, uh, primarily for that reason. I, I appreciate the amount of work that's gone into getting us to this point. Uh, each of these areas, I think, have extraordinary um, potential and capacity to uh, really significantly raise the quality of life for both Vic West and the downtown and the city in general. And I think that it's incredibly important for us to uh, pay very key attention to uh, what we do with all of these lands. Uh, and I appreciate the comments of my colleagues around uh, ensuring that uh, there's you know, potential for rail access as close to the bridge as possible. Uh, I appreciate the attention that's gone into uh, trying to find uh, areas where there, is, there are green spaces that are going to be accessible for use and not just looking at. I do think we can make some improvements on that. I appreciate the comments of the mayor around the fact that it looks like a lot of pavement. It does, and, and perhaps some of that is necessary. but. Uh, for me, I think we have to have an ongoing conversation about how to uh, find that balance between the necessity for pavement, because this is actually a road throughway uh, to a certain extent, uh, but that we use every opportunity we can uh, to minimize that to the very basic standards that we need for transportation, and that we look at the other opportunities uh, for the spaces around that transportation corridor uh, to make them livable. Uh, these are incredibly uh, important areas uh, for all of our communities. And I think the livability of those, these spaces should be uh, our secondary concern, only in the sense that uh, we need to look at the transportation corridors because they're required. But uh, very close to that, we need to make sure that the companion pieces to them really enhance the quality of life for our residents in these areas and throughout the city. So I'm, I'm happy to support this moving forward, given those comments. Thank you, Councillor Lucas, as a seconder, do you wish to add anything? No, thank you, Councillor Isaac. 
I can grudgingly support this. I think my uh, unease over this particular item has to do with overall concern with the bridge project. Um, I think there is potential to have three high quality uh, public green spaces on the northeast, northwest, and uh, southwest corners of the bridge. Um, I, uh, I do have concerns with the amount of pavement, and I realize that's basically in the civil works that the city agreed to uh, with the, the construction contract. And my views on that contract are well known. Um, I think there is a, a longer term road diet solution. Um, could we see the, uh, uh, like the image that Mayor Helps referred to in terms of the amount of pavement? There's no technical reason why there have to be two roads that lead to the bridge heading west. So it's been a choice that we provide westbound access from both Johnson and Pandora. But at some point, there'd be, I think, no technical reason why the city couldn't close the two westbound lanes from Johnson Street. And the way people would, would get onto the bridge when they're coming south from the downtown would either uh, take Wharf Street to Pandora uh, or go along Government Street and then go uh, west onto Pandora. So it's we have made the choice to provide two roads that merge into one. And I realize with phasing and volumes, there's challenges there. But I think we shouldn't um, lose sight of that option for a road diet, which would substantially increase the available green space and what we're currently calling Triangle Park and whatever future name may emerge. I think an, an interim fix would be with the public art, I think something very large needs to be looked at because it is a really unsightly place given the, I don't know if that's an acre of pavement, but I think of um, when, I, in my, when I was growing up, uh, I used to spend a lot of time at Kenora, Ontario that has a, has a massive fish called Husky the Muskie right along their waterfront. And it's basically a three or four story tall fish statue, but it's iconic and Kenora is known for it. And could we have a... 60 foot high orca, I don't know, or whatever else comes out of the process. So I think something large could work really well. I actually, I don't like the large statue in Bastion Square because I think that really detracts from the ambiance, but I think something large there could actually help to dwarf uh, all of the, the pavement that the city's committed to under contract with PCL. Thank you, uh, Councillor Madoff, and then um, Councillor Thornton Joe, and then I will speak. Councillor Madoff, go ahead. Thank you. I, I can support this. Uh, I guess you know, with with some degree of, of reluctance or, or perhaps regret. And it's interesting to go right back to the beginning of this and um, recognizing all of the complexities around the bridge itself. But I had such an interest and a concern about the public realm, and I think you know, in terms of the public. They're going to be really pleased that we, they, we've got a bridge that you can drive over and that it lifts when it's supposed to lift, and that'll be kind of it in terms of the bridge. What's really going to change the experience for our residents is the experience of the public realm and how well those spaces work. And I'm still really struggling that we're having to piece this together the way that we are. I think that was indicative right from the beginning when the $880,000 budget was, was put in place that we were going to have to do this. Um, but I think in terms of the, the feedback that we're likely to get from the public, I don't think it's going to focus on the bridge and all of the mechanisms that they'll never see that will hopefully work flawlessly. It's going to be what could be, and I hope still could be, you know, iconic public spaces that you experience as you move through them and as you use them. And I'm still very concerned about what they're actually going to look like. Um, some of the comments that we had shared over time, I don't really see them um, being responded to. And some things are probably set literally in pavement now. But certainly at the, um, the west end of the, of the bridge and those approaches, there was so much discussion with the landscape architect about what kind of fool the eye techniques could we use to reduce the visual impact of all of that uh, paving, which also will change um, driver's patterns as well. I mean, it's wonderful we've got the intersection at Harbour, which has really changed how traffic moves and how it doesn't move as well, which is interesting to see it backed up the street. But it's how you move through those public spaces. And I just think we really have to um, give very careful attention to what we can do to, we're not at the fine tuning 
point. We're at the planning point for so much of this, and there's a real opportunity there. And it's what we will be known for. It's not going to be the bridge that we're going to be known for. It's going to be what do we do with public space and how people move through public space and how we invite them to move through the city in a way that they have um, not been able to do before. I think the suggestion of, you know, um, you know, size isn't everything, but a large piece of public art could be interesting. I just want to remind Council that Council uh, previously did vote to reduce that budget. So there is some funding in place, but when you think about uh, what um, public art actually costs when it's out in the outside and how durable it has to be, I think it's going to be uh, interesting to be working with what is seen as a, um, a very modest budget, which is probably a third of what the cost was for the Emily Carr statue that's across from the Royal BC Museum right now. So I think we have to be realistic about that as well, because certainly it would be wonderful to have something that really speaks to the city uh, on that site. And having the two artists in residence, we have a wonderful opportunity, but we have to be mindful that they're going to be constrained by what would be seen as a very modest budget on a project of this size. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Thornton. Joe on the motion. Yes, um, I, I will be supporting it, but um, I think uh, only because there have been some wording changes or, you know, slight wording changes that um, uh, gives me comfort in, in that there's still more work to be done, still more uh, public engagement. Um, and as funding uh, becomes available, there's there's uh, some opportunity. Um, because I, I, I am concerned about the amount of uh, um, hardscape, recognizing that it, it is a public uh, roadway, um, but I think uh, you know I, I have to you know, respect the the stakeholders and the the public that were involved in, in the discussion. And um, I'm at, for me as the council is over downtown, I am hearing that perhaps uh, some of the goals that were stated in in um, what was supposed to be achieved when it came to uh, public spaces and and uh, uh, you know usable space and, and, and a park for the downtown um, it may not be achieved. And I can understand some of the rationale, uh, but I hopefully with the Northern Jet Plaza as that comes forward, there may be some opportunities that uh, we're going to discover. And, and it may be something that we're going to have to put on to uh, the application for the Northern Jet that this is going to be have to be a large piece of, uh, of the approval of the development. I, I'm not sure at this point. Uh, so I, I, you know, I think as we move forward, I will be keeping um, aware of uh, the concerns of the of of, of the the DRA, which, uh, as I said, I'm, I'm council liaison to, and I and I look forward to seeing the pieces of the Janion uh, move forward to address some of the concerns or or the uh, I guess the misunderstanding or or the fact that it is going to be achieved just on a phasing uh, process. Uh, so with that, uh, you know, I, I think as uh, Councillor Madoff, well, I uh, forget who was as one of the speakers said, uh, I think our focus had been on the bridge itself, for, and, and I think we can't uh, turn our minds away from the approaches, which are going to be extremely important, and I, I think that's where we're at right now. Thank you. Thanks. I have myself next. I'll start with an amendment. I have a proposed amendment to C um, to add the words uh, at the end. I know Councillor also referred to this in her motion or in her amendment rather, um, but I think we need to make it explicit. Um, so it's to add the wording and direct the artists in residence to propose a name for the green as part of their scope of work. Okay. Thanks. Uh, to motivate, it doesn't say choose or. Um, create but propose and again it would be at the discretion of this council to approve the name but I think they'll be doing lots of engagement on this and I think uh, a naming that's in in line with the art and something better than triangle green uh, would be great so a discussion on that amendment yes Councillor uh, Isaac can staff remind us is there any process underway to develop a, a civic asset naming policy Mr. Soulier uh, not to my knowledge, uh, there is not a, a process okay. to develop a policy. So I can support this. I think we do want to move away beyond ad hoc approaches. The CRD about two months ago, I think, adopted a regional parks naming policy, and I think it's time for the city to have that. Um, there's a very valuable provincial geographic names policy we can draw from. Uh, there's the CRD policy, and the provincial toponymist is the full-time FTE devoted to place names, and I'm sure she would be open to helping advise the city on the development of a, of a homegrown policy. So 
I think for this one-off, that's okay. But once we have a policy in place, this issue of place names won't have to come up on a asset by asset basis. A great point. Uh, all those in favor of the amendment? Any opposed? Okay, thanks. Just a free b few brief comments on the main motion. Um, I agree with what Councillors uh, Madoff, well, Councillor Madoff and others have said with regard to the pavement. I understand it is a roadway, uh, and it's a it's a busy roadway, and it's the, one of the key, well, the key roadway into our downtown. Uh, I think as we um, move through the the process, um, the next steps. I think anything we can do to uh, because. People will be driving, sorry, anything we can do to make it feel less road and more, to use your term, Mr. Tinney, like a people place, uh, the better. Because people will be driving their cars uh, along it, obviously. But with 50% of the bridge deck do uh, donated, not donated, dedicated to pedestrian and cycling traffic, um, there will arguably be more um, users not in cars than users in cars. And so we need to design the landscape to accommodate people first. And um, as I uh, I, I'm not convinced that livability is second. I think livability is first. Um, well, maybe they're equal, transportation and, and livability. So just I, I think you've heard very clearly that that's a, that's a priority for this council. Uh, other than that concern, uh, or not concern, just something I'd like to put forward. I'm, I'm very excited about this. Uh, I think it, we've you know all been struggling with the bridge project as it's unfolded. And as Councillor Madoff says and others say, here's a real opportunity. And, and I think, Mr. Tinney, you and your team have done a great job at presenting this as an opportunity. Uh, I look forward to, uh, and again, I really appreciate that what Mr. Johnson said, this will be part of our budget process, so we're not doing it as a one-off. Uh, I look forward to seeing, we've already approved a 20-year capital plan. We've got our projects relatively set for 2018, so within that scope, I'm curious to see what staff will come back uh, with. Uh, in terms of what we can do so that when the bridge opens, there's some nice places to be around it, uh, and then look forward to the longer-term um, plan as well. So I guess I have one question, uh, and then I'll cede the floor. Ms. Thompson, this is a question for you. Um, I know we've got lots of competing priorities for gas tax funding, but are any of these improvements that we propose to make um, that have been presented today, would any of them be eligible for gas tax funding? Uh, yes, Mayor helps. The, uh, the, the ones I can think off the top of my head are uh, the pathways uh, and things like that. I would have to look at the details of the, okay. uh, the program. Great. That so that might be a funding source, not necessarily for next year or the year after, but in the longer term, a, a funding source that could be applied. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Loveday on the motion. Yeah. <clears throat> I was going to lead with my concerns, but I'll, I'll lead with my excitement. And, and I, I'm, excited, I'm excited about how these changes will ultimately enhance our downtown and make more people friendly places in our core and I so I think uh, I, I really appreciate the, the approach that staff have taken in terms of presenting this as an opportunity and also uh, finding a, a way forward that doesn't uh, mean tax increases uh, so I don't support increasing taxes for the, for these public realm improvements and that I support this way forward because I think that means that we will not be considering these upgrades to public space as in isolation. They will now be part of the broader city budget. And that will mean that we'll have to build out in stages and probably delay other city projects. Um, and that's okay because we can't do everything at once. And so I look forward to seeing what, what comes back next and uh, knowing that this will mean tough decisions come budget time. Excellent. Thank you. Councillor Coleman? Thank you, and I'd like to pick up on Councillor Loveday's comments, because I think there was lots of comment in the public and in the press this week, and it relates to the difference between the presentation that we got and the recommendation. And if we go back to the part that says option one recommended, if you, we read it in light of this report, it makes absolutely good sense. And it talks about alternatives in, in funding sources. But if you read the presentation, option number one by itself, people read option number one recommended, two bullets, and they go to the last line which says, increasing taxes to fund these projects is an option. So that's the part of the context that the public saw. Um, and I think Jeremy's comments about we need to, this is a good phased approach, the recommendations make sense, um, and we can do this over time, and it will lead to some difficult discussions uh, as we go through the budget process. Absolutely fair. But I think that the recommendations are well said. We then have the communications issue of 
of the options including. So maybe we do option one, option two, and funding below that under a different title. I, I think it's the way we construct this. Um, I also don't want people to immediately take images that we've talked about of Husky the Musky uh, being <laughs> by the bridge. And as it happens, if we were there last summer, I was just sharing pictures with, with my two consoeurs here. Um, remember that that's in a completely different context. It's not in the roadway. So what we do for public art has to not be so attractive that people come up to have their pictures taken in the middle of a potentially busy roadway. So it's, I don't want that to become the, the context for it all. What we do with the uh, two artists in residence um, becomes critically important to making these pedestrian-friendly, public-friendly spaces, not just for that one triangle, which we may rename, but for the other areas too. And I think that that does become the part of the legacy that the public get to use in these public spaces. So thank you to staff for taking a difficult part of the process and bringing it forward. And I think we still need to work on some of the way we choose to share this information with the public more broadly. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, seeing no further speakers, I will call the question. All those in favor? Any opposed? Thank you, that carries unanimously. Uh, Council, I propose that we uh, deal with, or work through rather, uh, item number 11 now, the Great Neighborhoods Grants proposed changes to the policy, and then that we take a lunch break after that, just so everyone knows what's coming. I'll invite Ms. Jenkins and Ms. Stratford to walk us through the report. And also, Council, I wanted to note, um, we have a piece of paper a report here. There are amended recommendations. There were changes uh, made to the recommendation. There was re recommendations made in the body of the report that didn't make it into the recommendations. So the, the latest recommendations are in hard copy before us uh, right here. Good morning. Thank Good morning. Thank you, Mayor Helps. Um, before we get into, we, we will ask you if you would like a presentation. I'd like to acknowledge that we have the neighborhoods team here in the chambers with us today. I have Kimberly Stratford here at the table, and also uh, we have Mike Hill and Gary Pemberton behind us in the audience. So I'd like to acknowledge them for their great work in the neighborhoods. And with that, would you like to uh, have the presentation, or would you like to go directly to questions? Council, your preference? Yeah, presentation's a good idea. Lovely. I will hand it over to Ms. Stratford to take it over. Thank you, and good morning. Um, yeah. oh, okay. um, by way of background, um, the Great Neighborhood Grant Program was launched last year, and it was um, primarily to facilitate community development projects in the public realm. Uh, Council has approved a um, $120,000 annually for the budget and last year we had 22 projects approved all of which will be completed by November of this year. After we went through the first round of grants um, we realized that uh, review would be a good idea. We ran into a few issues in administering the program and while the neighborhood team noted some of these, we wanted to gather feedback and suggestions from the applicants and other organizations on how to improve the program. So we hosted two workshops, one for the public and one for staff, and we identified uh, the following issues and solutions. So the first thing was that we left $20,000 of funding on the table last year. And um, part of that was due to the late uh, implementation of the program but we really want to spend all the money and we know you do too so we've already begun um, implementing a multifaceted communications plan for this year um, we've got a poster campaign um, happening we'll be putting articles in the e-newsletters throughout the community we have a robust social media um, plan which you may have noticed already out on Twitter and Facebook and um, our city website has been updated with lots of good information on it. <coughs> For the first time, we've added an event to launch the program, and we're super excited about this. The intention behind this is to provide potential applicants with really great information on how to work in the public realm, introduce them to other funding partners, and inspire them with great ideas. We're also going to create a display in the foyer of City Hall promoting the grant program, and that will remain for a couple of weeks. In the area of support, um, applicants requested more support during the application period. And so 
what we've decided to do is that staff across all of the departments will be available to meet informally with the potential applicants. And we are introducing a mandatory pre-application meeting with an interdepartmental staff team. This meeting will allow staff to listen to the applicant, discuss their ideas, and provide guidelines on how to, and support on how to make it a successful project. If there are any permit fees, um, we can identify them at the time. We'll be able to help cost out some of the items on their budget, so we'll get a more realistic budget um, supplied. And we think that this upfront support will not only improve the quality of applications, but will provide the applicants with better support through the application process, and they'll feel more confident in what they're submitting to us. Um, some of the feedback we got was some uh, language cl clarity and the budget. And we always run into this, especially filling out a budget for a grant. So we have simplified our questions on the application form and we've provided um, sample budgets as well. So we hope that that will help people. One of the things in the criteria that we um, came up against was permit fees. and. Um, recognizing that some projects in the public realm require a permit fee. This can be seen as prohibitive for small projects. However, um, permit fees can't be waived. So uh, we're going to identify these permit fees up front and ensure that they're in the project budget. So this removes any element of surprise and it prepares the applicant for the permitting process. Um, another issue that we came up against was the lifespan of projects. And um, these are essentially $5,000 projects. The rest, the matching funds comes through from the neighborhood through their labor, their volunteer time, some in-kind services. And so we um, kept asking ourselves really what constitutes an acceptable lifespan and how are the costs of maintenance and removal accounted for. The um, original um, policy stated that these would remain in perpetuity. And we felt that this was a heavy, heavy burden on the community organizations to maintain these forever. Um, and that's not what happens with these projects. Um, in the past, um, projects have gone out in the public realm and then they fall into city staff to maintain them. And we end up carrying the maintenance costs um, for a very long time. So um, our proposal, our recommendation is that we uh, limit the lifespan to three to five years after which the project's either removed or we reevaluate it and the applicant agrees to maintain it for another subsequent period of time. Um, the lifespan and maintenance removals are noted in a letter of agreement which we have the applicant sign prior to giving them their grant check and we can just simply um, extend uh, the time period through another letter of agreement with them. Community art projects. So community art can be messy, and um, it's a, an organic process where an artist and residents create something together. It's not a single vision of one artist coming out and producing something. So um, we only have the art and public place policy in uh, at the city right now, which which the committee felt very uncomfortable using their standards for public art to. Uh, to adjudicate these art projects. So the arts and culture um, staff have worked with the committee and have created um, some guidelines to identify what kinds of projects fit within the scope of this grant project. And the applicants will work with art and culture staff in preparing their applications. So everybody's much more confident about the proposed project coming forward. And finally, um, in criteria, um, we heard from the community that they'd like to expand the program, move it beyond placemaking, and uh, really capture the spirit of community development, and um, asked if we could add activities um, to the uh, program. So uh, staff really reflected on the purpose of the, staff, of the grant program and we felt that organized activities very much fit into the spirit of what we're trying to achieve. So our proposal to you today is to retain the original category of placemaking projects for up to $5,000 and add a second category for up to $1,000 for activities, 
all within the existing $120,000. This will, um, uh, the activities themselves, um, the, the characteristics um, are very similar to the placemaking. They're initiated by local residents. They engage and educate our community. They promote community development. City staff will have a much more hands-off approach um, to the activities. We can provide them some guidelines and let them know if they need um, a block party permit or something like that, but otherwise we we'll really let them manage it. And they um, have a different lifespan as well, though, they, um, not to exceed six months. And they contribute to neighborhood pride. The kinds of activities um, that could include um, are educational programs, uh, neighborhood um, diversity programs, temporary site transformations, and new neighborhood parties. So we wouldn't be looking at funding um, existing neighborhood festivals, um, like Fernfest, for example, but we would be looking to um, encourage neighborhoods um, to look at ways to bring their neighbors together in a new way. Other examples could be um, a neighborhood skills fair where neighbors teach each other things like basic sewing, cooking, and art. Um, Boulevard free cycle day for furnitures and other household items so that um, anything left over is picked up and donated or taken to the landfill. This can solve some of our couch on our boulevards issues. And um, uh, it's possible the neighbors might want to organize an invasive species poll over a series of months. So those are just some samples. And the benefits to this, um, adding this new category, uh, really um, makes the money more accessible to a wider group of people. Smaller grants are easier to plan and implement, and people can try out something. They can run it as a pilot, and then if they feel that, there's, that they've got some substance to it or some traction, then they can carry on with it in another way. So... Um, in leaving it, um, our recommendations then uh, to amend the policy, um, changing some language in the definition section to add uh, the category for matching funding for activities, and um, changing some language in the maintenance section so we um, change the language from in perpetuity to the lifespan of five years. Um, and, and the third recommendation being that um, uh, staff are directed to update the strategic plan grant um, to exclude any proposal that fits within uh, the Great Neighborhood Fund. Thank you very much. I know there may be questions and comments, um, but I would like to just kick this off by putting the motion on the table, and if there's a seconder, thanks. Um, I think it's always uh, really important to recognize, uh, recognize excellence um, when it comes to us, and this is excellent. Um, this, is, this is how we should always be doing business at the city. We institute something, we, so we plan it, then we do it, then we study, then we act. And it's that PDSA cycle. We've actually got it in our economic action plan. But this, So I'm happy to support the recommendations, but I just really wanted to give a nod to this team uh, for the way in which you're bringing us these recommendations. This is, it, this is it's, it's excellent. Um, I, I can't say enough about it because this is a, a new project, a new, a new grant stream for council, and you've instituted it. You've gotten feedback from the people who applied and who didn't. You're improving the process, and then we're going to do it again. And maybe next year after this goes out, there may be some more changes to it. But uh, it's this spirit of continuous improvement. I just I really wanted to acknowledge this, this excellent uh, process and happy to support the recommendations. Uh, on the recommendations themselves, I think, oh, I do have one suggestion that hopefully it doesn't need to be an amendment. Hopefully staff will just be able to do it. I'll say it in a sec. Um, but in terms of the program itself and the changes, these are very small amounts of money that have a huge impact, not only on the projects themselves, but on connecting people with each other and with, with the places they live. So I'm really excited about that. I do have one suggestion that um, every year uh, when all of the projects are completed, I guess in November, can we have a project fair here at City Hall so that people can come and present uh, what they've done in their neighborhoods with all of the other um, uh, project recip grant recipients and also with the uh, council and the public so that this work not only can be celebrated, but then people can get ideas about what's happened in other neighborhoods. So can we do that? Awesome. Okay. Uh, other speakers with questions or comments? Yes, Councillor Isaac. Um, in um, your comments, Ms. Stratford, you referenced that um, maintenance uh, contracts or agreements could be renewed. 
but uh, the the proposed policy is silent on that. So I wonder about adding that language because the way it reads right now is that the organizations would basically maintain the asset for up to five years, and then if it fell in disrepair, the city would remove it. So I just uh, sent a proposed amendment to council members that right now that. Uh, section I of the policy reads maintenance and project li lifespan and this relates to section 2 of the motion that successful placemaking projects will be maintained for a mutually agreed upon lifespan not to exceed five years in total by the community organization once completed activity projects will be maintained for a period of up to six months by the community organization once activated if the item created through the project falls into disrepair, requires a replacement, or becomes a safety concern, it will be removed by the city, which is kind of a doom and gloom scenario. I know why it's recommended, but my amendment is we add the additional uh, wording at the end of that. Maintenance may be renewed beyond the initial term through mutual agreement of the city and the community organization. Thank you. Second. Okay, discussion I think I'm on motivated. the amendment. Yeah. I think it reflects what staff were suggesting would take place, but essentially gives some comfort to the proponent that there, there could be a future for their asset if we can reach agreement with them. Uh, I think if there was some other purpose the city wanted for the location or some other region or some other reason, uh, then the, the city could simply withhold its consent and there would be no mutual agreement and that, uh, uh, that maintenance program would cease. But I think it just provides some... When I look at some of these assets that are being built, the new garden shed and the Spring Ridge Common, I hope it's not so disposable that that thing has to be junked in five years. Now, that's also on school board land, but I think in the interest of not having a disposable society and a disposable city, we should try to give as much life to these assets as possible uh, where appropriate. Thank you. Further discussion on the amendment? Okay, all those in favour? Any opposed? Thanks. Questions or comments on the main motion? Yes, Councillor Madoff. You know, I'm very happy to support it. It's wonderful to get the information about what the specific grants were, and I think the notion of having the fair and having folks come here, it's just such an exciting time to, to see what people are able to achieve. The only thing that I wanted to add is just to, to remind Council that the um, public art policy specifically includes um, community art, and that the Art and Public Places Committee was really pleased to be able to offer their volunteer time to review the submissions as well. And we've got some great things that have come forward as a result, so hopefully many more. Excellent, very good. Further comments? Yes, Councillor Isaac? I just wanted to thank staff for their work on this. I think this is an exciting program, and we, when we look at the list of approved projects, both those completed but those pending, I think they will definitely add to all, the, all of those neighbourhoods. and. I think when we look at the value proposition and uh, what the community is getting for a very modest financial input, I think this is a project that should certainly be continued uh, and I think expanded. Um, I, I, with the activity section, I understand why it's proposed and I can support it. I think we do want to monitor it closely and my personal feeling is we, we don't want to lose the new sort of hard assets that are being created. So. I think leaving it flexible for now makes sense, but at some point I think we may want to look at a 30% or a 50% cap that the activity uh, proposals basically uh, rep represent a, a minority of the overall financial allocation, but I guess we'll see what comes in. And But I think the idea of getting new hard community assets and placemaking assets that people who don't hear about the activity can still enjoy in the years ahead, I think there's value there. Great, thank you. And on that note, can we ask staff to report back next year uh, on the split, what percentage our activities, or dollar amount or percentage or both, are, and what percentage are placemaking? Thanks, that's a great suggestion, Councillor Isaac. Thank you. Uh, all those in favour? Any opposed? Excellent, and again, great work. Um, Council will take a lunch break now, and we'll come back uh, to item number 12, revenue and tax policy benchmarking and 2017 tax rates. We definitely need to have lunch before we dive into that. But we're all here. Uh, except those of us who aren't. Uh, so, well, Councillor Young is away, so I didn't, I wanted to not be too literal. Um, Council, we are on uh, item number 12, revenue and tax policy benchmarking and 2017 tax rates. Uh, and Ms. Thompson, I believe this is our new-ish manager of revenue who hasn't presented to Council yet, is that correct? So maybe you could introduce him and then walk us through the report. Uh, your report, uh, your written report is very detailed um, and at the same time this is really complex stuff so I want to make sure you take as much time as you need to make sure that we understand uh, everything here. 
Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Um, with me here, I have uh, Steve Vella, who is our manager of revenue. I think you've been here almost a year. Yeah, and uh, but uh, I guess sort of first report to present. I'm actually going to run through uh, the presentation, and uh, we're here, both of us here, to answer questions. Um, so the purpose of uh, this report is to pro provide the updated benchmarks of, related to the revenue and tax policy and also to seek direction on the 2017 tax rates. The policy was updated in 2015 and it maintains the current share of property tax distribution among the property classes. We have uh, six or so classes and the taxes are allocated amongst those and uh, also uh, to report on the benchmarks annually. <clears throat> Excuse me. The first section of this uh, uh, presentation is, is related to the benchmarks. We have a couple of them related to the share of taxes. So in 2016, uh, the share of taxes paid by the business class uh, remained high when comparing to other municipalities. However, the, uh, this continues to be a historical low for Victoria. The share of taxes uh, paid by business is not considered unreasonable given the city's high concentration of uh, commercial properties and the relative, uh, relatively small footprint of, um, of the city. Uh, the concentration can be measured by comparing the business class building values uh, to residential class building values. So this slide here basically shows that in relation to how much assessed value we have in the business class, we are within the range of the share that they paid. Um, as you can see in other municipalities, uh, they, their share of assessed value is lower uh, than the tax share. When it comes to the ratio and the rates, uh, we had some changes between 2015 and 2016. Uh, in 2016, we had increases in both uh, business and residential class values, and uh, there was a tax rate decrease as a result. Also, the business class ratio was reduced from 3.12 uh, to 3.05. Again, that had to do with the fact that the assessed values uh, changed in proportion to each other. The uh, City of Victoria's uh, business tax rates are higher than many comparable municipalities, uh, but the usefulness of this measure is limited by the difference in land values uh, among different communities. So, for example, in Vancouver or the Lower main Mainland, their rates are usually lower, but their land values are much higher. So the actual taxes paid uh, can be the same or even more, even though the rate is lower. <clears throat> And at the end of the day, we basically have two main classes, business and residential, and uh, how it's shared between the property classes, um, the overall burden uh, remains high when compared to other municipalities. This slide here shows the uh, residential taxes per capita, and the city is fifth uh, amongst the, uh, the top, uh, or this group of um, communities. Last year, we were second, so we have moved down a bit from there. We also look at trends uh, throughout the community um, that would uh, related to the economy. Uh, building permits is one such item that we look at, and uh, um, the following measures are all coming from either um, our own data or uh, through Collier's. So we had uh, an increase in our uh, commercial per permits or our share of the commercial permits in, uh, in the CRD from 33% to 60%. And the majority of the CRD municipalities did see an increase in uh, the commercial permits. Um, Sandwich did see actually quite a drastic decrease, uh, but uh, the majority of the rest actually had increases. And the ratio of the commercial building permits to residential building permits uh, rose from 26% uh, to 48%. And uh, the two major factors uh, that contribute to this was that the residential building permits grew by 21%, uh, and uh, commercial permits uh, increased by approximately 120%. So very significant increase there. Another statistic uh, we look at are the vacancy rates. Um, and they, these are greater Victoria vacancy rates. So when we're talking about uh, uh, downtown and suburban, uh, they're not the city of Victoria's downtown. Uh, it's actually expanded beyond what we would consider downtown. Um, but the downtown office vacancy rate uh, decreased uh, from six, just over 6% to, uh, uh, to just over 6% from uh, 794 
and the overall downtown office office um, vacancy rate it actually has different classes within it and and they're very different the class a space which is the highest ranked space versus the class c space are very very different class a decreased uh, from just over two percent to just over one and uh, by class c was at 18 percent it did go down to 13 but it's still much much higher obviously than class uh, a for the suburban office vacancy rates, uh, they uh, decreased from 11.5% to just under 10. And uh, both Class A and Class C vacancy rates are high, uh, approximately 18 and 13 uh, percent, respectively. Uh, that's primarily due to an increase in the supply, and uh, notably the Eagle, Eagle Creek Village development. So the downtown retail vacancy rates also decreased uh, from just over 8.5% to 545 uh, and shopping center vacancy rates decreased from 5.45 to uh, 4.43. So that leaves the benchmark items there. And so for council's consideration, we have uh, four options uh, put for before you in regards to the tax uh, rate uh, allocation. And uh, the first one that's before you has, uh, is, it reflects the current tax policy. I wanted to point out that the overall revenue increase uh, for property taxes equals about uh, 3.6 million. And including utilities, the average increase is 2.91% for residential properties and 2.98% for business properties as out in the 2017 financial plan. However, of course, the tax rate option chosen by Council will determine the actual allocation of taxes among the classes. And I also wanted to point out that because assessed values for residential properties increased much more than uh, for business properties, we had an over 20% increase in residential properties and businesses where it was just under 8%. Uh, the business t class ratio would need to increase in order to avoid a shifting of the actual taxes paid from the business class to the residential class. So even though the ratio increases, it doesn't mean that we're actually charging way more to the uh, proportionately uh, to the the business class. So this option here would uh, see an equal uh, tax increase to all classes other than uh, industry. Industry under the policy is held at the same rate as uh, the business and because those assessed values or the assessed values for the indus industrial classes de uh, increased less uh, than the others, they will actually see a decrease in, in the rate. Uh, but we have just over 3% uh, to all others. And uh, for a residential property, that would mean approximately $69 uh, increase. And for a business property, um, we call them typical businesses, but we have a wide range of businesses. Uh, anything from the Empress Hotel, which is, of course, a very large property, to a small mom and pop shop. And uh, so we, we take a typical downtown business value at approximately $540,000. And that should actually say increase. I'm just reading my slide. Um, and so it's an increase of $197. So I see I didn't correct that on any of them. My apologies for that. Um, the second option here would see an equal increase to all of the classes. Uh, this was the tax policy prior to 2007. The uh, residential properties would see an increase of $68, and uh, a business property would see an increase of $195. The third option is to maintain the tax share at 48%, uh, excluding the new tax revenue. And this was the policy in 2012 to 2014 was to reduce the share to 48%. Uh, this option would uh, actually see a higher increase to the business uh, class, um, of, uh, they would see an increase of 232, and the residential uh, would be an increase of $57. And this option here was the tax policy for the business ratio from 2007 to 2011. And this would, as a result of the assessment changes, uh, this would result in decreases across the board, except for residential, which would see a very large increase of 8.42%, uh, resulting in a $192 increase for a residential property and a $169 increase for a business. No, it's an increase. I have I messed up the slides. So. <laughs> um, consistent. Um, so with, with that, uh, the recommended option within the report is uh, the uh, option number one, which is the current tax policy. And we're happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Questions? Councillor Isaac. 
I guess looking at the um, the reduction in the the tax change for the industrial properties, mm -hmm. I guess what's the the rationale for that versus having a formula that would uh, because major industry seems to f be fairly fixed in terms of very substantial capital investments and the risk of them leaving seems to be quite low. So I guess just trying to understand what's the rationale for provide, adopting a formula that would give that kind of tax relief? Uh, through Mayor Helps, the, um, the, the original debate, I can't really remember exactly uh, what, what um, the points were, but one of them, for no, not for major industry, we only have one of those, uh, for the light industry, or maybe, perhaps even two, um, but very few, and uh, the light industrial, are they're very similar to uh, a classics business, so at the time when the policy was implemented, and this has been in place for many years now, um, uh, the, the um, uh, council felt that they were very so similar that they should have the same tax rate. I can't put them in the same tax class because that is something that BC assessment determines. And prior to this, we uh, and what happens in many communities is that many light industrial businesses uh, appeal uh, their classification by BC assessment and they actually get moved into the business class. Um, that can, of course, continue to happen. But if council feels that uh, you would like to s stop having this policy, that, that's also an option. Um, because of the phase in that there's the tax change or like what would the tax change be if we adopt option one? Like what, um, it's hard without seeing a table that would show the 2017 tax rate. I guess I'm wondering if we pick option one, what is the tax change column going to say for major industry and light industry for, for this year? If you uh, pick, if you do not uh, stick with the, uh, policy to have the same tax rate for major and light industry, it would be this one. Okay. So, because okay. oh, it says 2016, okay, so that's based on what it was last year. Yeah. I got you. I should have mentioned that too. The reason I added in the 2016 tax rate, the first column there that says tax rate is what the 2017 tax rate would be. What I wanted to, uh, we've had many questions from the, uh, the community uh, or members of the community asking what will happen with the tax rates because of the assessed value ch changes. And in all cases, because the assessed values went up, the tax rate will actually go down right. uh, because the city sets the amount of money we need to collect. We don't set the rate first and then see how much right. money we get. We do the backwards math. In that regard. I'm going to move option two. Is there a seconder? Yes. Well, sorry, sorry uh, sure, okay, seconded for discussion. Okay, uh, I think it's just, more... Sorry, I just, I just want to remind Council of our discussion that the discussion would end. I'd thank staff for the, for the report and then I would ask, does anyone like to put the staff recommendation on the table? And then if no one does, we would go to another option, but I can only control what I can control, so that's the spirit in which we said we'd proceed. We have another option on the table now, so go ahead. Yeah, I guess if using, I guess, that tactical advantage will give some relief to business rate payers and residential rate payers, I'm prepared to use our procedures to get the motion on the floor. Um, I think in the, it, could we see that table for a moment? I, I bumped into someone yesterday who uh, works with Realmax, and he said that they have more business than they've had in years in terms of maybe 500 employees and ships coming out of all their berths and buildings. And I just don't see us, um, the very marginal change, um, having a, a negative impact on those industrial classifications. So I think in the interest of fairness to have that uniform tax change, uh, all the rationale we had over the years around tax share had to do with businesses downtown attracting businesses. But if we could see the previous slide, where we see that formula has the exact same impact, businesses and residential. So I think that argument, really the only ones that seem to be getting a disproportionate benefit are the industrial classifications, and I just haven't seen a rationale. So for me, a more compelling rationale is overall fairness and a uniform tax rate across all uh, classifications of property. Thank you. Um, I, I'll go to Councillor Alto as a seconder, and then Councillor Lucas. Uh, thanks. Uh, I have a question first and then a quick comment. Uh, actually, I think I've answered my question just by seconding this motion. <laughs> so so in addition to the, the fairness argument that's been presented, I, I think for me, I, I always have in the back of my mind 
Uh, the policy that we set a couple of years ago that we would try, uh, and in fact not just try but do, uh, that we would make sure that our um, tax increases would be inflation plus one percent at its max. And so the question I was going to ask, which I think has been answered, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, was whether or not the uh, recommendation at 3.01 would in fact exceed that ever so slightly, I understand, because we understand the inflation rate is around 2% is I think what, what we were talking about last summer. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Um, yeah, yes, Mayor, it helps. The, um, the overall increase does not change. Right. The allocation between the different right. classes Changes. is how it would be impacted. Yes. Slightly, that's right. Mm -hmm. Um, but having said that, I, I do agree that with the sense of, you know, when I'm looking at the uh, tax shares, uh, excluding uh, NFC there, and the tax rates, uh, it seems to me that, yes, there is a heavier burden on the industrial classes, but uh, obviously it's proportional and it depends certainly to the degree of how large these industrial entities are. But I think given the slight differentials that appear in, in those categories, that reflect uh, a tax change that being that is even across the board. I, I think that this is a reasonable uh, way forward, so I'm happy to second it. Thank you. I have Councillor Lucas and then myself. I've got a question. Thank you. <clears throat> um, just for discussion purposes in this, um, I know for someone who runs a business that um, under my tax, I still have to pay for my garbage pickup, and there's things that I don't get that's included with uh, residents. Can you um, let me know with industrial? I'm not clear. Do they have quite a few differences in when they pay their tax as to what their services are in comparison to business and residential? Um, through Mayor Hopes, that they would get the same other services as businesses do, like the street sweep, sweeping and those types of things. But no, we don't pick up their garbage. We don't do anything like that. They would have to pay for their water, for their sewer, and the same thing through the utility bills. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, my question, and I, I hope that there are some examples that you can give without uh, giving a laundry list. I, 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 when Councillor uh, Isaac put this on the table, he referenced RALMAX. Um, but I see also that light industrial would be included in this. So what, is, what, are, like, what are some examples of light industrial kinds of businesses? I mean, you don't need to name businesses, but breweries, are they light industrial? What are, what are some... Because do we want to really tax our, our microbrewers? Uh, do we want to drive that kind of industry? So, uh, uh, um, Mayor Hobbs, I know that uh, the majority of businesses that are in the Rock Bay area are light industrial. Um, I would have, for the brewery one, I would have to check. My, my initial instinct would be to say yes. Mr. Tinney's um, nodding. So all yeah. of our microbreweries, they're... Light industrial. What are what are some other? Because this is we don't want to have. I don't want to have unintended consequences. So in principle, yes, fairness is great, but in principle, also the current policy that we have seems good to me uh, and fair, uh, and our existing policy uh, as an option number one. But so, what other what other kinds of businesses are are light industrial and could be um, small businesses could be impacted by this? I think we would have to pull the information. We can certainly do that. Sure. Uh, but it's pretty much, uh, like I said, the, the businesses that are located in the Rock Bay area would be light industrial. Okay, thank you. Um, on that basis, I'm not prepared to support this at this time unless we have some more information about something that's going to persuade me otherwise. But um, I'll look to other speakers. Councillor Isaac? Well, to respond to Councillor um, uh, Lucas's comment, um, residential taxpayers, they have to pay for their garbage. If it's few, for fewer than four units, it's done through a user fee through the city's um, solid waste function. And if it's more than that, they pay commercially. So the difference is we don't allow businesses or multi uh, or owners of multi-unit buildings to access the city's service. But it is based, I believe, on a full cost recovery basis. Can Mr. Work address that? So in addition, so in addition to property taxes, uh, homeowners also pay a utility fee for for garbage. Uh, Mr. Work, can you elaborate? Through the mayor, I'm not able to actually speak to that specifics. I'd have to go back and get some more detail to provide a council. Ms. Thompson, hopefully, can so garbage from homeowners that's collected on a fully cost recovery basis, isn't it? Through the solid waste utility. Yes, that's correct. Yeah. And the, the on-street collection in the downtown in terms of garbage that's put in the public receptacles, how's that funded? Uh, that's funded uh, through property taxes. So arguably it's actually the businesses that are having it funded through the requisition in terms of garbage generated from retail sales. So um, 
I, I like the breweries. I, I frequent them often. But that doesn't mean I don't think they should be taxed um, at a fair rate. And if you look at the massive capital investments, I've heard Phillips is investing new funds. Vancouver Island Breweries ruled, rolled out a whole new line of product. Uh, I, I personally don't find that argument compelling against having a uniform uh, increase in taxes this year. Okay, thank you. I'm going to go to Councillor Madoff, and then I'll speak again. Thank you. I, I can't support this option. I think uh, certainly with the lack of full information, it's been interesting. The in initial motivation was look at Relmax can afford to pay, look at how busy they are. It's the light industry that I am most concerned about. And that's and then it, it's focusing on the breweries. That is one small component. Go up and down the streets of Rock Bay and see those small businesses trying to survive, whether it's a welding shop or an upholstery shop or whatever it is. To me, those businesses have always been so important to keep them in Victoria and to keep them viable. So I think the way that this has been characterized is not giving an accurate picture of who would be tremendously impacted and it's the light industry are the ones that really struggle to make it from day to day. Thank you. Yes, I, I won't repeat what Councillor Madoff said. That was I, that's why I was asking for a list so we could get a, a, a spectrum of who these people. Yeah, it's the furniture makers, the jewelers, the welders, the upholsterers. I mean, this is the the lifeblood of our small business that's not downtown retail. And so, you know, so I, I won't support this. But also because I think that our current tax policy that we've worked very hard on over the years is fair, and that's the recommended option. So. Um, it, yeah, I'll leave it at that, um, and maybe um, Ms. Thompson and team could provide us uh, a more detailed list working on it, um, and if not by now, um, by council this evening, certainly. Uh, other speakers? Okay, uh, yes, Councillor Alto and then Councillor Isaac. I was actually just going to ask the question of when we thought it was reasonable to expect we could see that information, because I, I certainly have no intention of, un of that type of unintended consequences, but that type of information would be really important for me to make an informed decision. Ms. Thompson? Uh, through Mayor Hopes, it's not hard to pull. I just need to locate somebody downstairs who can pull it for me. That's fine. And this is just a committee decision, so we can forward whatever we forward to Council tonight, and then we can, yes, Councillor Isaac? Do we know what the magnitude of the total taxes are, major industrial versus light industrial? The anticipated revenues, if we, let's say, did option one or option two? And why I ask is like under option one, it's a uh, it's basically a tax reduction of two percent, and if it really is about incenting the light industrial classification, then I think we should hone in on that. Um, whereas most of the tax relief under option one goes to major industrial, not light industrial. Um, I have the numbers. Uh, Approximately seven hundred and seventy-five thousand dollars is collected from the light industry, and one hundred and twenty-five thousand from major. Uh, I do know that we have a change in the major industry. There's actually one more that has come on this year, and I'm trying to get that information as well. Um, and uh, but that's roughly the order of magnitude. So the light industrial is a bigger category. Yes, it's about six uh, points. What am I? Um, yeah, point six five percent of the total uh, taxes, so it's less than a percent, but... Right, uh, I see that on yeah. the column. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to call it... Oh, yes, Councillor Coleman, and then I'll call the question. Well, thank you. Um, I actually don't like any of the options, but that's, that's a problem that happens every year. Um, what we tend to do is we look at these different categories and assume they're all of equal size, and they're not. Um, and so when... We used to talk about tax ratio, and we, we moved away from that. But when we talked about it, we said that um, historically we were at a low, I think, of 2.4 to 1 about 15 years ago. And as global economics changed, we wanted to protect the residential side, so we moved up the business rate, recognizing that they weren't. A much larger pool of properties were recognized in residential than in the business class. Um, and we assume that they both grow at the same rate, and they don't. So when you're playing with those numbers, recognize that there's a disproportionate impact anyway. Um, so the reason I don't like any of these, other than perhaps the third one, we identified it went, the, the ratio went from 2.4 to 1 business to residential, up to as high as about 3.6 to 1, and then we winnowed it back, and 
we'd always targeted, although it didn't make people happy, a three to one ratio. The only one that comes close to that is option four, but that has a disproportionate impact on the residential side. So of the three that are left, um, it's option one that actually has the lowest tax ratio. It's only one tool we use to assess, but it's about trying to make sure that people are paying a fair apportionment, recognizing there's different growth in the different uh, tax classes. So we targeted 48%. The danger in targeting 48% to come from business, or 47.75 versus 51%, is we see a lot more growth in the number of residential units that are being created. And so the 51% comes from a much larger pool and a growing pool. It's not the same growth rate in the in the business side. So we, we just have to keep that in mind. I think option one is the only one that works, but I say it grudgingly because I still think the tax ratio is too high. Um, so that, that's just the, the way we have to play with these numbers and try and find some fairness. When we look at what we were focusing on, the light industrial and the major industrial, those together, I think they came to about 1.7 million out of a $260 million budget. So recognize we're playing in a very, very small area when we're talking about equilibrating. We don't want to create the economic distress of having those businesses in major industrial and in light industrial leave. That's not the issue. This is about making sure that we try and find that benchmark that lets us move forward, but we're always going to have to use these tools against each other every year. And we've tried to say, no, it's going to be one form. I I think we have to perhaps uncouple some of the relationships as opposed to keeping them equal. But I think the best one is option one at the moment. Thank you. All of those. Oh, sorry, Councillor Lucas, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I certainly don't want to beleaguer beleaguer the issue um, with Councillor Isaac, but my point, I think we could debate who puts the garbage in the public receptacles but uh, and who's responsible. But my point was is... If was the light industrial. That's what I was referring to. And they are not, from what um, you, you're saying, Director um, uh, Thompson, is that they're not located in the downtown. They're out by Rock Bay. So um, I, that's what I was trying to, to get with, with my comments there. So thank you. Uh, I appreciate that. Okay, all of those in favor of option three, which is on the table? Sorry, option two is on the table. Sorry. Okay, one in favor. Those opposed? Seven opposed, so option two fails. Um, I propose uh, the staff recommendation, which is option one. Seconded. Great, thank you. Um, do we need to rediscuss? Okay, uh, and Ms. Thompson, you will bring that list to us tonight. Thank you. Uh, all those in favor? Any opposed? One opposed. Okay, thank you very much. And Ms. Thompson, thanks. It's, this benchmarking is just so useful, and not only for looking at the city, but also for the region. Okay, we move on now to item number 14, commemorating Lebanese immigration to Canada donation request. Um, Ms. Reddington is here from our Arts and Culture Department, along with our Deputy City Manager, Ms. Jenkins. Uh, And I'm not sure if you have a presentation. I know that councillors have some questions and potentially some suggestions. Welcome. Thank you, you, Mayor. Um, We have no presentation but are open to questions. Questions? Yes, Councillor Isaac? So if council uh, wished to proceed with the previous direction and uh, find a location um, for this, either within, basically on municipal land, either within the municipal road right of way or in an existing park or open space, what would the best process be to, to find that site? I think to direct staff to uh, find a site uh, somewhere not in the Inner Harbour, because uh, that's the, the problem has been with Inner Harbour lands. But we never actually indicate our very first, this is the th- Twice we have said find a site, and our original motion from Councillor Thornton, Joe, and me was extremely generous. I think it said somewhere, I think it may have said anywhere, but essentially we thought maybe somewhere in proximity to the water because it ha- does have to do with, uh, with immigration and people arriving mm-hmm. by sea. To so try something. I think we need to give staff some direction. I think I might, I, I wonder if maybe, so Councillor Thornton, Joe, has expressed interest in, in uh, potentially coming up with some suggested locations, and after two years at this, I wonder, I don't think I would, we would want to designate Councillor Thornton, Joe, but I wonder if just a one-month postponement to allow for consideration of additional sites as they arise and then let it come back to Council and see what ideas we might have. Maybe I'll do a walkabout and Councillor Thornton, Joe can, and 
other council members can, and then we can ask staff to report on the advisability of one or several potential sites. But for whatever reason, our staff aren't giving us a, a recommended site. The reason, and the reason staff can't recommend this to us is because our policy does not allow for it. So staff are hamstrung by the policy, so we need to give them some direction outside of the policy, which it's the purview of this table to do. Okay. So I see lots of hands go up. Sure. Councillor Isaac still has the floor, and then Councillor Thornton-Joe, then Councillor um, Coleman, and then Councillor Madoff. Sure. Because I guess council motions, I think, can trump policy, and we do have... Oh, absolutely. As the report we, says, yeah, it's over two years, March 12, 2015, a council member motion by Councillor Issa and Thornton Joe directed staff to work with the association to identify potential sites in city rights of ways, plazas, green spaces, or parks in proximity to downtown Victoria or Victoria Harbor. So it was a very flexible resolution. And I personally think that's still sound direction. And now it's just we are two years in, so I'm kind of like, maybe staff could report back within a month with a recommended site. That would, but if we wanted a bit more hands off, then I'd say let's just postpone for one month and wait for Councillor Thornton Joe to come to, to us with a recommended site. Okay. Um, let's have a discussion. Uh, or So Councillor Thornton Joe, then Councillor Coleman, then Councillor Madoff. And, and some direction would be appreciated so we have something to discuss. So just for our clarity, um, uh, Mayor Helps, you said we can have some discussion. Doesn't that be necessary questions? Well, I, I would prefer that somebody put some policy, even if I'm, direct staff to find a location and then we can amend, build on it, so we're yeah. discussing something rather than just And my using. understanding of any wording of a uh, motion that includes postponement means that we can't have the discussion. Is that correct? Yes. So that's, uh, I think that's where the... Well, but uh, okay. how about this? Let's put a motion on the table to direct staff to find a location. We can discuss that, okay. and then if we wish to postpone that at a certain point... So I'll put that motion thank on you. the table. Is there a seconder? To, okay. For discussion. Okay, Thanks. thank you. So, uh, firstly, uh, thank you uh, to the city, uh, the staff for the report. I understand that the report is based on um, policies that ex that exist. And I think as Councillor Isaac um, comments that sometimes things don't fit nicely into a policy and there may be um, you know, a, a means for council to... to um, do otherwise and or, or or add some additions to what the policy uh, states. So the the, um, the report itself, I have concerns, and I and I'm not saying any uh, slight on the staff because they are following the policy that currently exists. But where my concern is is the difference from when we commission a piece, which I understand should have fulfill uh, the policy, then when we are given a gift and. Um, I think when we're given a gift, I think we we need to consider um, other aspects. You know, I think we spend a lot of time at this table worried about costs of art, and here we are also given something that is not going to cost something. I know when I was in Quebec City, I was amazed by the amount of art that I saw in little areas that I didn't expect. When I turned a corner in a little alcove. Um, and, and I think when you have lots of art, it allows us to say there's some pieces I like, there's some pieces I don't. Whereas when we only have a few, as we heard this morning, council identified what they didn't like, and then on this side, and then I heard, no, that's a great piece. And we are going to have uh, our perception of what what is good art and what is not, and I think that's what art is all about. Um, and when I look at Quebec City, I believe they have like 40 um, statues and busts, if not more, uh, from what I could count quickly. And I think we, I don't know how many we have, but um, <clears throat> I think there's an opportunity to be able to add and support a gift that's, uh, that's being given. Um, you know, I, I understand we might want it front and center in the harbor, but I, I do know as uh, immigrants, and which I believe everyone at this table uh, is part of that uh, of that population is water has a significant feature in that it it symbolizes us coming to the the new land and coming to Canada, and I think the the Lebanese community is uh, in their desire to have the statue is 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 revealing that they're proud of being Canadians, but they they also recognize where they've come from, the sacrifices um, that their ancestors made to give them a better life. And with that, at the time, I'd like to recognize uh, Georges Mer from the, uh, from the Lebanese community. So, so you know, I think, uh, and just before we had this discussion, uh, the members of the Lebanese community, not only from Victoria, but from abroad, uh, met with Mayor and some councillors. And in a goodwill gesture, we discussed 
that we wanted to work on our relationship. We wanted to honor uh, uh, their contributions to our city. And that uh, we recognize that a statue uh, uh, that is identical in many cities. So, you know, we don't may not have the opportunity to choose the artists or the design, but I guess uh, whatever city was the first city that uh, decided on the statue made that decision, and they wanted that same statue in various cities, and Victoria being one of them. So I just think it's important that... Um, we include all types of art in our city, that uh, maybe we need to have our policy looked at um, to maybe broaden the scope. Maybe we need to look at commemorative um, statues or gifts and whether there needs to be different policies for that. I know we were given a statue many years ago, and I think it was controversial at this table, which was the Michael Williams statue, uh, but it is located... Um, uh, you know, close to, to, to swans today. And and I think, you know, I, there, once again, there's some people that love it, there's some people that don't. There's some people that sit there and take a picture um, with it, and there's some people that just walk by because it doesn't interest them. But I think uh, we need to uh, honor the gifts that uh, we're given. We need to recognize, um, you know, um, and, you know the the diversity of our our community and the people that came and made our city uh, the great city it is today. And I was talking to um, the executive director of the Intercultural Association, and she mentioned that you know when you walk around town, you know we're very fortunate that Chinatown is very prominent, and we we're very much uh, aware of the contributions of the Chinese community, but we have very little on any other groups that uh, that have contributed. So, you know, I think it's an opportunity for us to accept the gift. I think that I, I wouldn't uh, support the motion of, um, that is on the table uh, currently. And I think we need to, you know, work a little harder to see if there is some locations, as I said, may not to be right on the water, uh, but can have some viewpoint of the water. And I'm happy to, as if council would support, I'd be happy to work with staff on that uh, and the Lebanese community. Thank you. Uh, and thanks for putting something on the table. It may not be perfect. We may want to direct staff to report back, but at least it's something, uh, according to our procedures bylaw, to allow us as a starting point to give staff direction. Uh, I have Councillor Coleman next. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, I understand the, the intent of the motion, but let's remember where our process is. We have a process that we've asked uh, all art to go through, and I'll reflect through one that was brought up this morning, which is the Emily Carr statue, which was clearly to a uh, favorite daughter, artistically, of this area, and it didn't make it through that process, the art, the art in public places. It ended up going on private property in the precinct that worked um, for, for a range of different reasons. So there are other options that are available here. To be fair to the art in public policy, the art in public places policy, and the work that was done by both staff and the... Uh, volunteers from the Art and Public Places Committee, they looked at this and on balance said, it's not supportable, we respectfully um, decline this, but we are aware that you can always go the political route. So in, just term, in terms of process, it's probably better to honor the recommendation from the Art and Public Places Committee and then say, and we want to instead go the political route, if that's what the, the choice of uh, this table is. Because what we're then saying is, are there other areas that we could find? Are there private lands in the precinct that might work? Or are there other areas? And, you know, we have a, uh, an Afghanistan memorial that's coming up that also wanted to start off in the legislative precinct and moved up to a different precinct in town because that's what ended up going through the, both art in public places and the policy, and we found a different place that works. So I think there are other options opportunities for the uh, Lebanese diaspora to be recognized across the country and throughout the world. But I'm not sure that it does our policy or our standing committee any favors if we just sort of ignore the work they've done. I think it's cleaner to say we recognize the policy and we understand how that works, and then we go into a second phase, which is a more political process. Thank you. And that's uh, apparently the process we're in right now, the political process. Except we jumped the first phase. We, didn't, we actually haven't accepted the recommendation from the committee. 
Okay, uh, well, maybe we can do that as part of this motion. This motion is just a starting point. If people wish to amend it, um, they can do that. Councillor Madoff. Thank you. The, the reason that I pers first put my hand up was that I felt that, uh, in my view, um, staff were being unfairly criticized for not following council instruction. And I think that's very unfair. The position that, that staff and the advisory, um, the public art committee found themselves in was a very specific request on the part of the donor for a very prominent location on the, har on the inner harbor. And that was duly looked into and recognizing that the most of the, that the properties that would have been appropriate were actually under the ownership of the, of the province staff reached out to the province to see if they would identify a location in order to respond to the wishes of the donor. So I really want to be very certain that we're not casting aspersions on staff that somehow they've dragged their heels on this, when in fact they were trying to respond to a very difficult um, request. I'm sure you can imagine how many groups or organizations would love to have some kind of commemoration on the Inner Harbour. What the, the committee and staff were trying to do was to, is there a location that has meaning? I mean, you can put a statue, you can plop it down anywhere, but if its location doesn't have meaning, then what is the story that it's telling? One of the challenges with this one versus the, the statue in Halifax is that Nova Scotia actually did enjoy a very significant immigration on the part of, of Leb the, the Lebanese population. In Victoria, it was basically two brothers. So how do we acknowledge that in an appropriate way? At the same time, how do we respond to the donor's request that this go in a very prominent location in the Inner Harbour? And that's why the committee and staff spent so much time considering it recognizing the, the feelings, the emotions, the generosity that was all involved in this. So I'm very concerned if coming out of this, there's a sense that the committee hasn't done its job or that staff have dragged their heels. The comments about the, uh, the communication from the committee, I think, have focused on one aspect of the letter from the chair of the committee, uh, which talks about um, perhaps quality of art. That was the least of the considerations. It had to be identified because it's part of the policy. What the committee discussed was where is an appropriate location for it. So I hope that we're not going to uh, denigrate the work of the committee by suggesting it's their, their personal professional views about the quality of art that, that drove this discussion. It was about trying to find a meaningful location to tell this story. I mean, it's like the Sun Yat Sen. It makes sense that it's there. And so could we find an, a, another location that would work for this one as well? And unfortunately, that wasn't the case. I think what we have to also take into consideration is that there is work being undertaken in the work plan about how we deal with commemorative statues and gifts. And that work has not been done yet, but it is in the work plan. Because otherwise, we're going to end up in this situation where it becomes a kind of a, I don't know, uh, I don't know. Becomes so it becomes political, it becomes personal, it becomes, oh, it's so ungracious not to accept something, so then where are we going to put it? And policy is actually a good thing if it's designed in a way that it's fair and it's transparent. And I think when we have the policy around commemorative statues and gifts, that's, that's going to be very helpful because otherwise we accept things and then what do we do with them and, and where do they go? So with the motion that's on the table, Directing staff to find a location, well, based on what? They have looked everywhere to try to find something that's meaningful. If we want to go beyond that and just say we simply want to find a location and we're not going to be so concerned about the fact that its location in and of itself is also a part of that commemoration, then I think that becomes something that unfortunately becomes a political decision and it should be over to council to make that decision. But at the same time, I think it's really important in terms of the record that we keep, as Councillor Coleman was suggesting, of I, I would have been more comfortable if the motion from the committee and from staff had been put on the table. If it had failed, fine. Then we would go to the subsequent motion, but we would have that history being told of, of how this decision was made. Okay, thank you very much, and I appreciate that. Um, I've got myself next, and then Councillor uh, Isaac. Um, back to Councillor Isaac. So um, what I would like to do is 
try and make some amendments that satisfy some of the things that Councillor Coleman and Councillor Madoff have said. Um, but I have a question first. And <clears throat> um, Councillor Madoff uh, referenced that the donor wanted it in a prominent place near the Inner Harbour. But Council's direction was very broad. So uh, I'm, I'm just I'm trying to understand um, what staff were responding to. Was it the donor's request or was it Council's direction? Because the, the donor may want one thing, but council gave direction about something else. Ms. Reddington? Yeah, through Mayor Hopes, um, we reviewed the criteria that council gave us in terms of the site location that uh, Councillor Isaac read out, read out earlier. Um, we then went on a site walk with parks and planning and uh, with and also the, the, the donors. Uh, and we reviewed the sites, and many of the sites were not owned by the city. Um, and there was a real desire to have it near the water, and there's just limited sites. Um, and so that was the real challenge with this. It, it is just really limited in terms of our opportunities in the Inner Harbour, and there's a lot changing within the Inner Harbour, so that's been the challenge. Right, but Council's original motion didn't talk about the Inner Harbour at all. It's It said... Yes. Right. Okay. So let me, based on that, let me try some some um, uh, amendments. And and uh, yeah, I, I don't think that there's there's no one to blame here. Um, we're trying to figure out a solution. Um, I, I guess before I make my amendments, I wanted to speak to the main motion, which I support that we find a location for this in the city. Uh, it doesn't need to be in the inner harbor. There's lots of waterfront. We have ample space but for me in, in meeting with the, the donors um, in, a, in a group in my office uh, with Miss Reddington was very moving um, yes there may have been only about two brothers um, but this is about multiculturalism it's bigger than just the Lebanese community it's a symbol of multiculturalism of Canada as a multicultural place and Victoria as a multicultural city so I would just like to just broaden the lens from beyond just the Lebanese community to a symbol of multiculturalism so I support us finding a place in the city for this statue now um, on to amendments so uh, I would like to and this is a bit odd because usually our motions just have actions in them but um, I would like to I'm just looking for the wording here to acknowledge the work so the amendment is to begin with to acknowledge the work and advice of the Art and Public Places Committee okay thank you I'll just do them one at a time thank you uh, moved by me seconded by Councillor Thornton Joe discussion on that amendment would it just be more of a sentence that council acknowledges the work and advice Sure. Okay. That council an amendment that council acknowledges. Okay. Very good. Uh, uh, amendment to the amendment to add the words that council. All those in favor? Any opposed? Thanks. Uh, on the amendment. Okay. All those in favor of the amendment? Any opposed? Okay. Uh, and then and that council to direct the rest stays around that council direct staff to find a location for the Lebanese immigrant statue uh, somewhere in the city of Victoria. Okay, moved and seconded. Discussion? Uh, Councillor Isaac? I'd like to add additional language at the end of that. Ideally within proximity to Victoria Harbour. Second. Okay, moved and seconded. And I think Victoria Harbour, I believe, is defined either provincially or federally is essentially from the mouth of the harbour at Ogden Point to the Selkirk Water. So that's about two kilometres of shoreline on both sides of the harbour that we can work, work from. Okay, and so proximity doesn't necessarily need to be touching the harbor's edge either. Okay, ideally within, so amendment to amendment, ideally within the proximity of Victoria Harbor. Does anyone wish to discuss that? Uh, all those in favor of that language? Any opposed? Okay, none are opposed. Uh, now the amendment reads somewhere in the city of Victoria, ideally within the proximity of Victoria Harbor. Um, further discussion on that? Okay, yes, Councillor Isaac? Councillor uh, Alto did bring up the whole Dallas Road waterfront as another option. We do have a lot going on there with various pathways, but that could be an additional amendment within proximity of Victoria Harbor or the Dallas Road waterfront. But I, Are you proposing that as an amendment? Well, and then there's also the harbor front in Vic West. Or we could say or the water Victoria Harbor or the waterfront. Okay. okay. So Councillor Isaac has the floor. So So I'll move an amendment within proximity of Victoria Harbor or the city's or the city's waterfront. Okay, seconded, moved by Councillor Alto, seconded by Councillor, um, sorry, moved by Councillor Isaac, seconded by Councillor Alto. Uh, on the amendment to the amendment? Or now the we're up to probably about seven kilometers. Councillor Isaac, go ahead. Now we're probably up to about seven kilometers of water frontage to draw from as for potential okay. sites. And my interpretation of the original amendment was 
that the harbor included the whole waterfront, but we may as well be as precise as possible. Um, okay, on the amendment to the amendment or the city's waterfront, uh, any discussion? All those in favor? Any opposed? Thanks. Uh, now the amendment, somewhere in the city of Victoria, ideally within the proximity of the Victor of Victoria Harbor or the city's waterfront. Further discussion on that? Yes, Councillor Loveday. Okay. Staff, does that give you more working room? Uh, through Mayor Helps, yeah, we'll, we'll discuss this with Parks and Planning, and, uh, and it will really be that, you know, it will really be Parks and Planning that will really have to inform um, where, the, where the statue can go at, the, at this point. Okay, thank you. Yes, Mr. Soulier? Mayor Helps, if I might just clarify if, the, if Council's direction is for public property or we might look to private property as well. Is there a specific desire on the part I of I think Council? we've left it open. Completely open? Yeah. Okay. Uh, on the amendment? Yes, Councillor Isaac? It's going to be on the mo main motion. Okay. Uh, very good. Um, I will speak uh, on the amendment. Um, right. What Councillor Thornton Joe said about Quebec City uh, is really important. You, this kind of unexpected art that you stumble upon, it doesn't need to be like at the most visible place on Dallas Road. It could be at a little nook along the path where, oh, look, who's that? What's that about? Oh, Lebanese immigrants, oh, Victoria is a multicultural city in a multicultural country, huh? And then you continue along the path. So I'm, the word prominent is not in here, and I think that's really important. It could be this hidden, tucked away, you know, delightful surprise that people, that people come upon. Uh, not in the middle of a forest anywhere, I'm not saying, or, or bushes. But, <laughs> but just, you know, I think when we think statue, we think public place, we think it has to be this, you know, clearing all around it. And I think what Councillor Thornton Joe said about... Um, uh, Quebec City is really important this unexpected art and there are certainly lots of stretches along the waterfront where there are delightful unexpected places that this could go and have a, a big impact. Any further discussion on the amendment? Yes, council. Oh, okay. All those in favor of the amendment? Any opposed? None opposed. Okay, so the main motion is that we're thanking and acknowledging the work of the Art and Public Places Committee, directing staff to find a location for the Lemonese. I don't need to read it. It's there. I have two, three more speakers. I have Councillor Loveday, Councillor Madoff, Councillor Coleman, and then Councillor Isaac on the motion as amended. Councillor Loveday, go ahead. Yeah, I'm very supportive of the motion. I'm glad that we'll be uh, finding a location for this statue. I think it's a, a generous gift, and it's a, a worthy artistic symbol of, of, of our multicultural city and of the Leban Lebanese uh, immigrants. So, Thank you. And apologies to my colleagues over here. I can't remember if I said Coleman first or Madoff first. Okay, uh, Councillor Madoff, go ahead. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm certainly familiar with, with Quebec City, having wandered around it a great deal and, and, and that feeling of discovery when you happen upon something, but what you might not realize is those are all the result of probably the most detailed and sophisticated public art policy in the country. And so you may think they're just scattered and they're random, but they're not. So I think it's really important to understand that because I think there's a sense that policy is going to limit the opportunity for happenstance and discovery and that kind of thing, and that's not the case. I have to say, after having this discussion today, uh, it just makes me even more anxious to get going on the, the policy for commemorative statues and gifts because it always puts us in a very awkward position. Um, even with that, we may have uh, um, councils who choose not to acknowledge it, but in terms of fairness, uh, what do you do when people come forward and, and, and want prominent locations for commemoration or whatever it might be? And I think it's our responsibility to treat everybody fairly as well. And I think that's what the existing policy does. And if it can be expanded through the commemorative aspects and gifts as well, it will just improve it. I think this has been uh, certainly a learning experience for, for everyone. Uh, but I said, as I said, you know, for me, the bottom line was you take a gift, how do you make it relevant? How do you make it important? How do you make it have meaning? And to me, when you take a piece of art, regardless of what it is, and you just put it somewhere for the sake of putting it somewhere, it really denigrates that piece of, that piece of art and the commemoration that's intended. So that was my concern. Thank you very much. Councillor Coleman? Thank you. We've wandered through a number of places. I think the other thing you have to remember if we're going to talk about Quebec City is it um, is not just the city, but it's the NCCQ, the National Capital Commission of Quebec, uh, that led a lot of that. Um, we don't have that same option anymore in this area. We don't have a provincial capital commission that guides some of that 
uh, artistic expression. And if you look up the word proximity, uh, it talks about space, time, or relationship, which goes to what Councillor Madoff was saying. So one of the most unusual uh, cultural pieces we have in this city is actually in the middle of the new <clears throat> Royal Jubilee Hospital precinct, which is the tribute to Morioka and Dr. Inazuna Tobe. And it's there because there's a personal relationship that it was at Royal Jubilee Hospital that um, Dr. Natobe died. So it's about finding those relationship points that then allow <clears throat> these, these gifts to be embraced and properly presented. Um, I'm, I'm supportive of this. I, I think it is important. And I think from the perspective of the Lebanese community, it's critically important that their thread be seen as part of the mosaic or the tapestry that is the Canadian persona. And that's great, but it has to be done in the context of all the other threads we have as well. So it has to be meaningful for the Lebanese community and explain part of the story to the rest of the country. But I don't know that uh, we don't do ourselves a great disservice when we, many years ago, we turned down a memorial to the freedom fighters of Hungary from 1956 for a range of different reasons, because it didn't fit our policy or the, the ad hoc policy we had then. So I think it's about trying to make sure that this works from a number of different perspectives. And it may mean that the Lebanese community has to take a look at options that aren't in the Inner Harbor, maybe in some other precinct that, that does work and, and still explains the narrative. Thank you. Councillor Isaac. Oh, sorry, I'm going to go to Councillor Lucas. You haven't spoken on this yet, and then I'll go back to Councillor Isaac. Go ahead, Councillor Lucas. Thank you, and I, I apologize if I missed it, but um, I really understand what Councillor Madoff is, is speaking to. So if we have to do an expanded policy on this, what, what is the time frame? What are we looking if we just say, let's hold off for now and... So as part of the Arts and Culture Master Plan, we're actually reviewing the policy right now with the Art and Public Places Committee looking at gaps, and this is one of the gaps that were identified. Um, and so uh, that will be coming forward, uh, update next week, and then uh, July we'll, be, we'll have the uh, draft of the master plan for your review. Mr. Johnson? I just wanted to briefly touch base on one thing that was brought up in terms of how long this has taken. This has taken a while to come back to Council because of the hard work of our team. Um, these are um, recommendations that came forward as a result of policy and not being uh, political in our recommendations. We bring forward administrative recommendations for Council and ultimately politically Council makes the end decision. So um, I just want to acknowledge the hard work of our team and bringing this forward in a difficult uh, set of circumstances. Obviously staff don't want to bring forward no's to Council and put Council in a difficult position but administratively we followed the right process um, and that's why it arrived to you this way. Thank you. Um, so, Councillor Lucas, you still have the floor. Yeah, if, thank you. If I could just... Um, so, is this... A, a, can't we wait till July? Like, are we going to lose out on this uh, statue between now and then? Like, let's finish off the policy, let's make it a clean, and then we have the opportunity. Uh, I think this is really important, and I really understand, um, you know, the... Um, uh, history on all of this. I think it's wonderful. But I'm just wondering if, if, in fairness to everything else that's going to come forward, if we could just wait. What are we, April, and we're talking maybe July, so another three months. Um, uh, Ms. Jenkins, uh, so I just, uh, you don't have to, uh, that's ultimately our decision, but uh, just for, for some more, uh, or, or Ms. Reddington, when you bring us the Arts and Culture Master Plan in July, will you be asking us to adopt the plan, including the policy recommendations coming out of it? Yes. Okay. Okay. So it may be, it may be prudent then to, to wait. Uh, Councillor Isaac? So, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. No, Councillor Lucas, you still have the floor. Okay. I, I just wondered if I could put a motion on the table to ask for this to be, um, delayed, I'm yes. sure the right word, until that comes back to us in July. So that would be, the motion would be to postpone. Um, before you put that on, though, it does cut off uh, further discussion. Oh, so that's okay, but I can come back to you for that motion when everyone's had their say um, to postpone consideration of this until we receive the Arts and Culture Master Plan, including the policy. Yes, Councillor Isaac? Uh, I won't support a, mo support a motion to postpone. I think this is a work in process. I think Council accepted this donation with the resolution of March 12, 2015. So that's now 25 months ago. The same way when there's land use applications that are submitted, we consider them on their merits without saying we're pulling up the drawbridge. 
until the local area plan is approved. So I wouldn't support that. I think we're talking about one work of art that council unanimously voted uh, to essentially accept, asking our staff to tell us to work with the donor to figure out a suitable location. Um, that working with the donor piece seems to be where it got stuck because I'm not sure, but based on what staff are saying, the donor uh, had a fairly specific vision for the location. Uh, but I think now with this broad language, as well as the broad language in council's original motion, it's clear that the city wants this um, statue to be installed in the city, and it's just a question of where. So I wouldn't support it uh, being tied up in that broader policy question. Um, with something that's maybe missing from this motion is the reporting back to council on the recommended location. I don't know if that's implicit or if that needs to be. I think you should make that. So I'll implicit. move that just language be added at the end that uh, and report back to council with the recommended location. Okay, thank you. Moved by uh, Councillor Isaac, seconded by Councillor Alto. Uh, discussion on that? All those in favour? Any opposed? Sorry, actually, I'm going to recall the vote. As long as I have a comment on the amendment, as long as when it comes back to council, we trust that staff have explored this and we don't say, well, what about this place? What about that place? I mean, I guess that's, that's legit, but we're, we're tasking staff with this. So when it comes back to us, we're not going to say, oh, well, I went for a walk and I picked that place. Why didn't you? So, <laughs> right? We have to be fair to our staff. So that's okay. Now I'll call the question. All those in favor of the amendment? Any opposed? Okay, thank you. Um, Councillor Lucas, do you wish to move to postpone? Okay, go ahead. So... Thank you. I would like to put the motion on the table that we postpone this until uh, July when the staff report back to us. Is there a seconder? Second. Seconded by Councillor Madoff. Okay, that's not a debatable motion, so I'll call the question. All those in favour of postponing until July? Two in favour. All those opposed? Six opposed. Okay, uh, sorry, five opposed. Six opposed? Yes, uh, the motion to postpone fails. Um, thank you for raising it, though. Uh, and any further discussion on this topic? Okay, all those in favor? Any opposed? Okay, uh, Councillor Madoff and Councillor Lucas opposed. Okay, thank you, Council. Good discussion, hard discussion. Thank you, staff. Good work, uh, and we'll look forward to your report back. Um, I do believe that the rest of the agenda items have been covered off either through the consent agenda. So for people who are following along, um, we dealt with items 15, 16, 17, and 18 uh, through the consent agenda earlier today. And we also dealt with items 19 and 20 right after item 6 uh, earlier in the morning. So at this point, we need a motion to adjourn the committee meeting. Thank you. Moved by Councillor Coleman. Seconded by Councillor Alto. All those in favour? Any opposed? Thanks. I would now like to convene our council meeting and ask Mr. Coates to read for council and the public the reasons we propose to close the meeting. And that's under section 91I of the community charter received advice that is subject to solicitor client privilege. Thank you very much. For that reason, council, could I have a motion to close the meeting? Thank you. Moved by Councillor Loveday, seconded by Councillor Coleman. All those in favour? Any opposed? Thanks.